So I have no clue how we want to start this off. I've I've also never done anything like this before, and um, I don't. Uh, I've told people this before. Uh, I'm not always confident teaching people how to sing because I have my own kind of. Uh, I mentioned this to you last night when we were figuring out how to do this, that I uh, I learned a lot of my singing through trial and error, and I was very lucky to have a family and friends that were all very supportive of that, and uh, I had a lot of family members that also did a lot of singing in their lives and were musicians. Uh, so I basically grew up in the perfect environment to explore a bunch of different singing possibilities mm. and try a bunch of different things. And a lot of people don't have that, that privilege. Um, so when people ask me how to sing or if I have any tips for singing, um, I feel a little lost because I feel like I have no idea how to tell someone to start from scratch without that, um, upbringing, you know? Yeah. I, I think it brought to one of the points that um, you mentioned to me last night and just mentioned in general, some of these techniques, especially involving like the false fold and stuff like that, if you're doing it wrong, it could be very damaging to your voice. So, um, it, it, and sometimes like when I'm talking about subharmonics, my voice hasn't been damaged at all by subharmonics because it's more of a, more of a lighter technique, even if it not might, might not sound like it at times. But um, like I've taken voice lessons uh, for years. Jonathan has had plenty of um, family and friends who are singers as well that he could have learned from when he was growing up. So if if you want to be serious about these techniques, something that Jonathan always says, learn how to sing first. Yeah, because then which will actually lead to something I'll mention later when we're actually talking about subharmonics. But if you understand your voice really well through practice and through training and through just learning through either a voice teacher or classes or online or something like that, then um, you'll be able to n sometimes navigate these techniques a lot easier because you it sometimes it takes place in around in your larynx just that you've been there before. Like if you're doing fry, a little bit and you'll be like oh wait subharmonics i kind of i kind of get it so yeah. um that's just a disclaimer um uh, that, that we both wanted yeah. to bring to you that's that's pretty much a, a tldr of my entire story of how i discovered subharmonics which i'll get into later but yeah that's um i'm glad you brought that up what what i always tell people um i guess a, a good way to look at it is you need to learn how to you need to learn how to ride a skateboard before you can learn how to do a kickflip. You know, like if, yeah. if if you try to just like, cause that's the thing, right? Is that like these subharmonic techniques and the false fold techniques and the grit that I do and the, the crazy like eighties metal screams that I do. Um, those are like kickflips. Those are skateboarding tricks that I only know how to do because I've been riding a skateboard for such a long time. And, but, People don't see someone just riding a skateboard down the street and say, I want to do that. They see Tony Hawk and they're like, I want to do a kickflip, you know? But if <laughs> yeah, you're going to hurt yourself, <laughs> you're going to hurt yourself if you've never touched a skateboard before and you start trying to do kickflips right away. Um, I, I might have taken that analogy a little bit too far there, but I think, I think you guys get the point. Um, this is advanced no, stuff. 100%. This is advanced stuff. And if you don't have... Like, I tell people several years. I tell people, like, you need to be, like, learning how to sing clean for years before you should start trying any grit or any subharmonics or any, um, you know, crazy mixed stuff. Because people always, they don't understand how to, where their support needs to be. They don't understand uh, where they can push and where they shouldn't be pushing. Um Mm. and they just end up um, they end up hurting themselves or they end up giving up because they can't figure it out and as much as it sucks to always just tell people you need to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on voice lessons uh, it really is important that you either if, if you can't get voice lessons uh, find some kind of online course or like get get professional advice on how to how to sing before you 
Um, don't try this at home, I guess. Is this this segment yeah. of the video. <laughs> we we just got a we just got a comment on my stream from uh, Johnny Stewart from the Wellerman. He says vocal kickflips. I like it. So hey Johnny, maybe we'll refer to that as uh, yeah from that as now on <laughs> these techniques as little vocal kickflips. Yes, but um yeah, and also if you haven't sung before and you want to jump into these techniques, your voice isn't prepared for it because it hasn't had any training. You don't want to just go to a gym and put like two hundred pounds on like uh, the bar for bench pressing if you have, if you've never done it before, you're gonna hurt yourself. Yeah, and then you won't be able to ever do it in the future because it could cause permanent damage. Yeah, that's another analogy that I love to use. I had a, a close friend of mine who um, who uh, does some work with me now, uh, who I, I, I was in a high school band with him. He's one of my oldest friends, and he's trying to get back into singing again, and I was talking with him about that exact concept about how um, people don't realize that your vocal cords are a muscle just like your biceps. You know, mm. like you, you are literally using a muscle uh, and just because you, you can't see that muscle, you're not cognizant of that muscle in the same way that you are with your biceps or your whatever. I don't know enough muscle names, <laughs> but um, uh, just because you're not cognizant of those muscles doesn't mean that, you know, that they're not there and you don't need to keep them in shape. So uh, just like you said, like. You're not going to sit down at a bench press after never benching before and try to bench your max. Like, you are going to hurt yourself. You might even get yourself, like, permanently damaged if you tried to do something like that. Like, straining a muscle, dropping a, mm. you know, dropping the weights and breaking your wrist or something. Like, that's, yeah. that's the dropping kind of thing. Dropping on your ribs. Ugh. Yeah, like, that's the kind of thing that people a lot of times try to do with singing is they don't respect uh, the journey and they don't respect the muscles and they, it's I mean it's almost like a it's almost like a, a journey to get physically fit uh, or or like lose weight or something as well it's like everybody likes the idea of building muscles um, but in practice like uh, if all that you're seeing is the progress picture of somebody who's out of shape and then you know now they have a six pack uh it's easy to want that six pack, but it's it's hard to to go to the gym every day for uh, two years straight to 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 get yeah. that six pack. So that's basically what we're talking about here um, is getting getting your getting your vocal six pack. <laughs> exactly, getting your vocal six. pack. Yeah. that's a good title for this. Yeah, that's up harmonics. No, yeah, but yeah. It, it's easy to get like when you see the before and after pictures, it's like two inches over. You're like, oh, wow, that could be me. But it doesn't show the lo the entire process through that. It doesn't. And you have to have like the um, a mindset of longevity with this. Yes. Because if if you just want to be like, oh, yeah, I want to do it now, then you're not going to be as motivated if you plan this out through a long period of time and be like, I want to do this like I want to be so proficient at this when I'm older so I can do all these things, then it can help motivate you more for that. So you have to have that picture of longevity. Yeah. Now, so I'm going to, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, uh, I think this is actually a good place to start. I know that I, I had this written down in the, the little notepad that we had, uh, yeah. since we're already kind of talking about it. Um, things that singers usually mess up as beginners. I thought it would be nice for us to touch on that really quick. Uh, 100%. Because it does, this stuff that he's about to talk about is very important to these techniques. So you want to know about this before we dive into the cool stuff. Well, yeah. this is still cool stuff, but like the funky cool stuff. Yeah, so especially those of you that are watching right now, whether you're watching on Twitch or later on on YouTube, if you're watching this video, uh, I wanted to kind of start with this. Uh, those of you that are not experienced singers, those of you that haven't been practicing much, uh, maybe this might be a topic for a completely separate seminar that Bobby and I do sometime uh, for beginner singing tips but for now uh we just want to kind of touch on some things where i'm already seeing people in the chat saying i've been trying to sing and something isn't right and i don't know how to fix it this might be uh this might be the the segment of the stream for you um a light bulb yeah and uh bobby throughout this seminar for a lot of these traditional 
vocal coaching things, I'm probably going to defer to you for a lot of this stuff because I, I think you have more uh, voice lesson uh, training than I do. Uh, so feel free to just completely cut me off and tell me I'm an idiot if I say something wrong. Um, <laughs> but, we shall see. Uh, so That's the why it's good to have two minds on this. Yes. We can complete the puzzle of um, each other's conversation. So the first yeah. thing that I wanted to bring up the first thing that beginner singers always mess up, uh, there's a couple different ways that we could explain this, but I, a lot of people call it breath support. Um, and I'm not good at explaining this, so maybe Bobby can kind of, uh, kind of carry the torch on this one after I stumble through it. But basically, um, most people, uh, when you're talking normally you're not really fully utilizing your full uh, lung capacity, your full, uh, you're not pushing tons of air through your body when you're talking, and you're usually just kind of like moving air just kind of through your throat. But when you're singing, uh, especially if you're singing with a lot of these standard techniques that we need to be doing, um, you, you actually need to be singing from your whole body. You have to be pushing mm -hmm. air like you know, using your diaphragm, actually using your chest muscles to, to pump air through your body and pushing air from deep in your diaphragm. Uh, and it, it, I, like I've spoken with a lot of beginner singers, uh, who will mention that it feels weird at first because you're pushing more, like it feels like you're sh kind of, I don't want to say shouting, but it feels like you're kind of obnoxiously loud the first time that you like, ha, ah, you know, try to sing with your chest voice because most people aren't used to projecting like that. So you kind of need to like mm. get into this different mindset and it kind of has to, it's like riding a bike. It kind of has to click where you're like most people will, they'll just try to sing like this and then they'll, you know, they're singing from their throat, but no, like you really like if, if you, if everyone talked the way that they need to be singing from their chest voice, they would be talking like this, you know. Um, Bobby, do you want to? Oh, yeah. Do you want to extrapolate off of that? Because that's about my. <laughs> that's about the end of my. <laughs> no. Yeah, hundred percent. So uh, obviously, yeah, as Jonathan was saying, it's gonna feel weird at first because it's not natural. I remember when I first started singing, um, I struggled it with it for a little while, and this was back in high school, so probably like six years ago. But we'll get to that. In a little while as well but um but yeah the main thing is um what he was talking about when you want to support you want the support through your diaphragm like a lot of people they they try and just like they try and just breathe like la or something and then it just they don't have the support and it will hurt their voice and it just everything will go wrong so the the way you want to just start off is like if you feel like your stomach right under your ribs, just like breathe in, feel that expand, make sure your shoulders don't go up, and then that's how you get the good breath in. And you also want that because if, if you're just singing, if you're just making your vocal folds do the work the whole time, you're gonna get tired. Your voice is gonna uh, go out and it's just not gonna sound great. You're gonna be tired. You might hurt your voice. So that's why you want your support through the diaphragm, not the support up here. This every essentially most of it is coming from your diaphragm. That's where most of the force force comes yeah. from. But um, yeah. yeah, that's that's one thing about that. Another way to think about it is like um, like tension or like reaching. Like some people will kind of like when they're trying to hit certain notes, they'll kind of try to like reach for it with their throat instead of pushing yes. more power. Uh, and uh, really like if you're trying to belt, if you're trying to sing high notes, you have to really like, it's almost like a, like a Dragon Ball Z kind of like summon all of your energy kind of a thing. And uh, you really have to like, yeah, like push it all out. And like, don't think about it like you, ah, ah. like don't think about it like you're reaching up there for these notes with your throat. Think about it like you're, pushing with through your whole body to get those notes um yeah one one of my friends um david khan who is a, another subharmonic guru he um one of the cool things that he said is 
get, sometimes when you're thinking of like notes when you're going like higher, like ah, you're like thinking like going up. Try and think of it instead as like going, just going from like left to right, going from left to right instead of high to low when you're going from high to low in your voice. Because if you imagine your voice going up like that, then you're gonna try and reach up there and it's it's gonna sound strained, it's not gonna sound great. So think of your range as going like this, like up and on and on. Yep. Because also your vocal folds, they're not like, they're not, and if I say vocal folds, that's the same thing as vocal cords. Um, they're not like this, they're positioned right there and they're gonna be right there, like kind of like laying down in your larynx and that's how they're gonna stretch. So yeah. that's another thing to keep in mind. Yeah, so some two other things that I put down in my notes here for this first beginner mistakes thing. Uh, it, it's kind of some quicker stuff, but I I always notice that people, uh, especially beginners, won't do this properly, and then they get confused why they don't sound cool. Uh, and they're very two things that are very closely tied. The first is enunciating, and. If you're not a native English speaker, or if that's a big word for you, uh, enunciating just means all, like emphasizing all of the different parts of the word, uh, all, yes. all, all of the different syllables. Make sure that when you are singing, people understand exactly what word you are saying, right? Um, and that's kind of tied to what I mentioned before about how people, uh, it feels awkward to do that at first, so people don't like to do it. It, fe it feels different to be singing like this and pronouncing every word perfectly. It, it feels weird to do that, but yeah. if if you don't do that and you're kind of singing like this and you're not really that, like, you're going to sound bad and people aren't going to know what words you're singing and you're not going to, you're not going to understand why. Uh, so... That's something, and uh, I've been uh, doing a lot of work with this producer, Howard Benson, uh, who's like Grammy winning uh, rock music producer, um, who has produced a lot of bands like My, Chem My Chemical Romance, Three Days Grace, uh, a bunch of bands. And, uh, and uh, he's kind of been like mentoring me about a lot of music production stuff. And, and one thing that he always, always tells me is, the singers have to enunciate clearly it like all the mm. time. He, he says that con like we, we had a singer come in who didn't want to enunciate clearly and Howard like kicked him out. He's like, I don't want to work with this guy anymore. He, he doesn't, he doesn't want to sing clearly and the fans aren't going to be able to hear what words he's singing. We're not going to, we're not going to sell any records with this guy, you know? Yeah. Um, if you, if you get into the situation that you're in a studio with the producer, it's it's a very good idea to listen to what they're trying to tell you. If you think, oh no, this might sound be might sound better, you can like ask them that. But they've been like, especially the guy that Jonathan's been working with for a while. Also, quick side note: I do some see some chat uh, questions and comments. I'm not ignoring them. I will get to them in just a second. But um, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, the producer, especially ones that do a lot of mixing, a lot of tracking in studios like that. They've been doing that for years and years. Like, the, the, that guy's probably been doing it longer than I've been alive. And it's, they, he knows what works and stuff. I know this doesn't really, well, it kind of does because we're talking about enunciation. Yeah. But uh, listen to your studio producer. Okay, yeah. back on topic. The other thing, uh, which is very closely oh. tied um, to enunciating, is vowel shapes. This is something that I see yes. uh, beginner singers struggle with a lot. Um, and uh, it's something that most people don't think about, but an easy way to think about this is if you've ever done like a funny accent or a voice or something, like if you've ever like pretended to sound like somebody else, what you're actually doing to, to make that different voice is you're, you're shaping your words differently. You're making different mouth shapes and you are, um, like, for example, uh, if you were to do a southern accent, right? Uh, southern, southern, 
Like the way that you're pronouncing those vowels is actually different. And the same thing is true for singing. So if you want to sound like a certain style of singer, uh, for example, um, if you want to sound like a country singer, or if you want to sound like a choral singer, or if you want to sound like a metal singer, or like a Disney character or something is something that, uh, that I do a lot. Um, you have to think about, uh, these two things. How are they enunciating and pronouncing their words and how are they shaping their vowels? Uh, and if you're not thinking about that and you're just kind of singing the notes, right? Like if you're just like, if you're just hitting the pitches, if you're just singing the right notes, that's, that's not even half the battle. You could be singing mm. all the right notes. You could be perfectly in tune and singing all of the right notes. But if you're not thinking about how you're delivering those notes, how you're pronouncing those notes, then you're just going to sound like somebody talking, but in with notes, you know, um, such a big thing. Yeah. Like for real, a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, uh, one of the questions was, um, from, uh, Johnny, which he says, do you ever practice speaking with, uh, with that singing resonance? And, um, I'm going to briefly just talk about resonance because it's going to come back later when we talk about subs and, uh, or the different kind of subs. We're actually going to talk about several kinds of subharmonics today. Um, but um, usually the way to resonate more, the thing that helps me is, it's kind of hard to see, but um, if you feel like well, your larynx, which is your like, kind of like the hard, the hard part of your throat right here, when, when I'm singing, I like, like to lower it a little bit. So I lowered it right here. You can kind of hear it compared to like up here where it's a little bit raised or up here where it's really raised, but no one talks like that. Yeah. But, um, so one of the things for resonance, I like to keep my larynx a little low, not to the point where I'm like shoving it down. Um, but like just a little bit lower. So I have a little bit more resonance. Also, you want to create a lot of space in your mouth. If you take your tongue and slide it from the front of your teeth all the way to the back, you'll feel where it becomes hard and then soft. That soft part's called your soft palate. You want to raise that because like right now I'm talking with it uh, lowered. Right now I'm talking with it raised. It's a little bit more resonant and stuff like that. And you want to have, keep your mouth open. So like when we talk about subharmonics later, it's uh, a good rule is like one of my vocal teachers said, if you take three fingers, if you really want to resonate, that's how much space you want. Yeah. Like, that, that's another that's thing. You want that's another mouth. thing that's going to feel weird at first is opening your mouth that yes. wide. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for those of you in the chat that, um, uh, sorry, I'm putting down a marker here for all these different things we're talking about. Um, for those of you in the chat that might be unfamiliar with some of these words that Bobby is bringing up, like soft palate and uh, larynx and, and, and resonance and stuff like that, another way to think about this is um, w what I like to, to tell people is like, um, if you're like angry at your dog and you're telling your dog to stop shitting on the carpet or something, excuse me, I, I need to stop swearing on my stream. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> if, um, if, uh, if you're angry at your dog and you're telling your dog to stop pooping on the carpet, you're kind of going to drop into this like, no, no, like, you know, like you're, you're, you're not going to go, no, stop pooping on the carpet. Like you're, you're, bad you're dog. yeah, yo, you're so bad. Like you're, you're no, like you're kind of going to drop into this like deeper, more resonant, angry voice naturally. And you kind of need to think about what are you actually doing with your throat when you do that? And, um, and same goes for the opposite when Bobby's talking about the soft palate, um, there's like, uh, I don't remember what it was, but a, a, a voice teacher once told me a, another good analogy for that, where it's like, um, like, th like, you know, like, just talk oh. like this, you know, like, uh, like, I, I don't know and how to describe it, but, it, uh, it also raises when you yawn, when you yawn, you like create like. Yeah, mm, that's like as open oh. as your mouth can possibly get. Everything is like nice and wide open. Yeah, like ma it's yeah, like it, it. It's goofy, but like, like imagine like a like a a fairy sighing. You know, like ha. Ah. You know, <laughs> like kind of make that sound, Lovely. and you'll notice ha. Ah, 
yeah, it's up. It, it feel it. Your throat feels different. Yeah, the Mickey voice. Yeah, like <laughs> you, th- there's a lot of different ways that you can think about it without needing to know these these terms like passaggio and and you know um, uh, soft palate. But y- you're these are just words to describe the different parts of your voice uh, and the different parts of your throat. And if you can remember where those different spots are um, and learn that vocabulary, uh, that'll be super helpful because Bobby and I are going to be lightning fast talking about like, oh, I'm flipping my, uh, flipping through my passaggio into my mixed range so that I can do this. And I'm flipping down back into my chest voice. And then I'm using my chest voice mixed with false folds to do that. Like th- there's a lot of different terminology and it can get very daunting, but you just got to think of think about it like what is that like falsetto and soft palate is the mickey mouse voice chest voice is when you're you're angry at your dog uh or you, whatever yeah um that was great yeah i love that. <laughs> that, that 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 i'm gonna use that analogy now for now on that's yeah. that's perfect because there's like a, a lot of because a lot of those things that you do in everyday life. Well, maybe not the Mickey Mouse voice for some people. Um, the, do help like do these tech, not specifically these techniques, but get you in a better position to do these these techniques. But yeah, yes. stumbled my way through that, but we're good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No worries. All right. So I was going back to some of our notes. What yes. do you think we should talk about next? Well, we kind of just covered vocal ranges a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, before we get oh, too we deep into too. Perfect. Uh, before we get too deep into subharmonics, I did kind of want to talk about just being a bass singer in general. Um, I'm so happy you put that in the notes. Yeah, um, I almost bolded it because that's <laughs> that's big. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I'm so put this in the yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I ke- I keep stopping to put a marker down because I want to make sure that we're putting all these different things on YouTube later. Uh, and I ke- I'm this is such a, a good conversation that I'm like losing my train of thought and 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 needing to stop. But um, yeah. So um, Bobby and I spoke last night, and we both wrote down some notes uh, about what we wanted to talk about for our little bass singing uh, seminar here. And one of the most important things that I really wanted to talk about is um, kind of the context of what it means to be a bass singer, not just from a technical standpoint, but kind of from a cultural standpoint. Uh, Because um, I can't speak for Bobby and I can't speak for uh, many other bass singers, but just to kind of share some of my own story... um, I grew up in a small town, kind of on the edge of the country, uh, between the suburbs and the country. Um, and like I said, uh, I was very, very lucky to have a very musical family, um, and a family that was super supportive of singing and encouraged me to, to find my voice and explore these things. Uh, and my father was a church choir director and he sings bass baritone as well and my grandfather his father was a bass two in barbershop uh singing uh choirs and and barbershop quartets so my family specifically has like a um a a kind of a bass legacy uh and many of the the women in my family are are altos as well so it's it definitely runs in in my family's blood to be proud of having a low voice uh, for singing. Um, But I was very lucky to have that upbringing. And a lot of times what I would see in the choirs that I was in and with the singers that I would sing with is that our culture, especially in America, doesn't really appreciate bass singing very much. Most of, uh, I would almost say all of the singers that we lift up, especially modern pop singers and rock singers, are all singing uh, in, in high, they're all tenors, more or less. Um, 
almost all of the singers, uh, even the ones that sound like they have deep and resonant voices, are often high baritones or, or low tenors. Uh, and, um, and I would always meet bass singers and baritones who would just feel unwelcome in the music world. Uh, like they just, there just wasn't a home for them because you hear the, the Justin Bieber's and the Freddie Mercury's and the, um, you know, uh, the, the post Malone's, the, the, uh, ACDC, like all, all of these guys, uh, they got famous off of the acrobatics that they're doing in their very high tenor vocal ranges. And you really don't hear about, uh, singers, um, that are getting famous because of how low their voice is. And we could have a completely separate conversation that I'm sure we could spend the entire seminar on about the science of, of why that is. Because, um, for one, when you are a tenor, when you genetically have a higher voice, uh, because your vocal cords are like tighter, that's why you can sing higher is because your vocal cords are like tighter and smaller. That actually makes your vocal cords more nimble. That, that literally genetically means that your voice is more agile and you can, you can do all these crazy kick flips up in your high range because your voice is built to be able to be more agile. Uh, and bass singers, uh, you know, we were dealt the hand that we literally have larger vocal cords and, and it, it's like in a video game when you have a, a, a very high strength and a very low dexterity. Uh, it's, it's, it's like, uh, most bass singers just genetically because of the way that our voice is built, we can't sing these crazy fast vocal runs and, and acrobatics nearly as, as naturally and smoothly as people with, uh, you know, with, with genetically tenor vocal ranges. And that means that we're kind of out of the race for doing Justin Timberlake sort of stuff. Most of the time for doing these crazy, you know, um, and sync oh, yeah. like stuff like that. Um, and <laughs> from a scientific standpoint, um, higher sounds stand out naturally to your ear. So if you have a bunch of guitars and a bunch of uh, a bunch of you know drums, bass, guitars, and then you have a high singer, um, that high singer, their voice is naturally going to stand out from the guitars and the bass. But if you have a low singer and you also have a bunch of guitars and instruments happening underneath that low singer, it kind of gets muddied up, be just because the the frequencies that the lower singer is singing uh, is 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 in the same range as the guitars and the bass and that means that they are overlapping each other um so you know i uh in the the high school choir that i was in growing up all of the basses were like not motivated to pursue a career in singing with a few exceptions they were not really motivated to continue singing culturally. They didn't really feel like they were, they belonged in the singing world. And all of the tenors were the ones that were very excited about being singers and very motivated to be singers. And, um, and even myself for the first five years of my cover song career, you can see it happen. You can see how hard I was trying to be a tenor for most of my career. You know, like you can literally look at my old videos and see how desperately I wanted to be able to sing like a high voiced rock singer. And because of that, I was missing out on, uh, I was missing out on so much unique potential that my own voice had because our music culture doesn't really incentivize basses, uh, to, to, be as excited about being in the spotlight and singing uh, as it does other people. And that was even with a very supportive bass family, you know, even with such a great bass singing support group that I had growing up, I still felt like I wasn't really welcome and wanted as a bass singer in the music industry. So 
imagine how unwelcome kids who don't have that support system feel as bass singers. Um, so I kind of just wanted to acknowledge that. And I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that, Bobby? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I was also just, uh, someone in my chat let me realize that the title of this stream on Twitch right now is Halo Infinite. So <laughs> I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to change that. There should be, but, um, there should be, if you add a, a button on your stream, uh, your stream manager on your Twitch dashboard, you should be able to add a button that says edit stream info and then click that button. Edit. Oh, wait, I think I have it. Uh, edit stream info. Yep, not Halo Infinite. How to sing some harmonics. Yes. Moinix. I always type Moinix. Yep. And there. Okay. Um, though I agree with everything you said. E. Uh, I'll be honest. Well, which point did we stop off at? I was I was trying to do this for uh, the last like three minutes. I was just I was just saying like uh, like uh, it's hard for me to it's hard for me to imagine um, how unmotivated and unwanted kids who don't have a a, a musical uh, like a, a, an encouraging musical support group must must feel uh, and hundred percent yeah no that um because when I started doing this bass singing thing. Also, Johnny said, bases are the, we are the tanks. Bases are the tanks. Good thing about our vocal folds being thicker, vocal cords being thicker, is that they, they get damaged a lot less. Still don't push it too far, but like, I did not know that. hurt your voice a lot less than sopranos. Because, like, imagine how thin their vocal cords are. They're much more fragile and not as thick. But yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, um... Uh, I, I get comments all the time on my videos, um, like just on my bass singing videos saying like, wow, I was a bass singer. I I didn't really see like a point to bass singing until like now. It's because, the like Jonathan was saying, there's like, ra nowadays, there's rarely any bass. I can't name a single bass on like pop and rock, pop and rock radios. Sure, there are some in country, but there's all the other genres it's not really like yeah. happening in which the, the only the should, only one that i can think of i don't think he's a i think he's a baritone is uh david draymond from disturbed um, oh he's my favorite yeah that's the only yeah. I, i'm pretty because he did that sound of silence cover and that was like yeah. one that was one of the only times that a mainstream rock song has come out that the tenors couldn't do and i could do yeah because <laughs> because i remembered I that. that yeah i remember that i was like oh my god this is like a hit rock song and for the first time i don't have to change the key <laughs> i think i still yeah. did end up changing the key to make it even lower but um yeah. yeah to be fair he does go wild in that song yeah like he he really gets up there but the beginning with with um the first two verses yeah i remember listening to that song like the day it came out mm -hmm. and i was like Oh my, I was just laying on the floor, staring at the ceiling. I was like, he's he's singing low. Yeah. But yeah, he has a crazy range. But it's always so nice. Uh, that's like only one of the only things in recent memory, like a hit song like that that came out in rock or pop or yeah. something like that, that like had a low singing part in it. Yeah. Which, which and I really appreciate. That's why I'm so excited, you know, like w people can debate about like whether or not social media is good for humanity or whatever, uh, for, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's a separate discussion. Yeah. But, um, but part of what makes me so excited about social media, uh, and stuff like TikTok, um, which obviously you've found uh, great success on TikTok, uh, stuff like YouTube, uh, which is kind of my home field. Uh, part of why I'm so excited about those platforms personally is because uh bass singers have found a home there and mm -hmm. um and before the internet you there wouldn't be things like the misty mountains cover songs that every bit like it's almost like a rite of passage now for a bass singer on yeah. the internet to sing yeah like like the bass singer yeah song. like misty mountains uh the halo theme um oh, the, yep. you know the, there's all of these songs uh, 
I've been getting yeah, Sound of Silence as well. Yeah, that has a little part too. Sound of Silence and uh, and f- I mean for me it was the Disney villain stuff where uh, oh yeah, I kind of had this realization that no, like at the time back in 2014, uh, no one else on the internet was doing like real deep voiced full production Disney villain covers because there weren't any bass singers making YouTube covers at the time, you know? Um, yeah. Still, there's barely any. Like, now now on TikTok, thankfully, there's a there's a, a whole new generation of singers coming up that uh, that includes a lot of bass singers. But when I started, yeah. like, uh, like, I would have to explain to every single musician that I worked with, like, I have to change the key of this song. Like, I, I would have singers, like, send me, like, hey, we're going to do a cover of this pop punk song. I have the instrumental done. And I would have to call them up and be like, I can't. I physically cannot sing these notes. I either have to, I either have to back out of this or you have to redo it because you, you like, it, <laughs> like, I would have people assume that, oh, you can just sing it in the original key. It's fine. Oh, yeah, ju- yeah, just, just sing the high it. notes. Ju- yeah, just sing it. It's like, no. That that's Why can't you sing it? Just you're a singer. You can sing it. It, it doesn't work it. <laughs> like that. Um, no. And I mean, there's 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 so much baggage that we could get into on this topic, and I don't want to bloviate too much. I I am very passionate about this topic of like making sure that bass singers feel welcome in the music world. Um, yes. But. Um, uh, but you know, like there's other things too, like, uh, like America kind of generally has like a weird masculinity complex about things like singing and dancing and, and art and, um, genetically, like, I, I, I don't know the science of this, so I don't want to like speak out of turn about this, but generally guys with lower guys whose voices drop more typically have like, it's, it's hormone related in a in a certain way and like that's another topic but um then there's kind of this weird thing where you get these dudes that that feel like they have to be very masculine and they have low voices and then they're told that being artsy and being passionate about singing and being passionate about you know uh, they're told that those things aren't manly because they live in this culture where there's that weird stigma about those things. So I like I had people in high school like call me slurs that I would not even like dream of saying on this Twitch stream because I liked singing. Like that's you know that that's how bad it was that like I I liked to sing and I would have these like you know these kids that would come into school wearing camo that would just like literally like <laughs> call me really despicable things yeah. uh, uh th- that was like tied to my masculinity so i had kind of a i i developed kind of a complex about that <laughs> growing up it was like wow you know Imagine. like um and and i was in a town that was relatively like progressive or or whatever i was in a very i grew up in a very artsy town that spent a lot of money on its art and music programs uh so i can't imagine like thinking about how many kids there are out there growing up in the bible belt surrounded by people that are that you know think that they are whatever for just because they want to sing and they you know um it it kind of it it that weighs heavily on me thinking about that. So my hope with this seminar is that someone out there watching this is in that situation, and us talking about this candidly and opening up about uh, tips and and you know speaking to the to the viewers um, can be helpful to those people. You know. No, a hundred percent. That that was a point that I didn't think about bringing up here, but now that you brought it up, it makes complete sense. That's that's one of the things now that um, as we're progressing through, because that was that was probably what like a decade ago, around maybe a little more or less. But um, I, I feel that in some some areas, people are appro- improve uh, in 
improving. There's the word improving in that. And so it's, uh, it's kind of getting better. I feel, but I also agree. I'm not everywhere. So I can't tell. Yeah, I agree. But, uh, no, that's hundred percent. Yeah. All right. So, well, let's, uh, let's get into some nitty gritty stuff here. Oh yeah. Okay. So, um, I think, okay, good. We check out that. Okay. Uh, so for the subharmonics part of this, because I know you guys have been waiting for a little while. Um, I just wanted to tell at least, uh, try and tell a brief story of how I got into it. Um, like when I started singing, I was a uh, junior. That's when I started taking voice lessons. I think I was a junior or a sophomore in high school. And, and for reference, I just graduated college now. Um, so about six years ago and I started, I didn't even think about singing because I had been in like musicals over the summer and stuff like that, but, but I hadn't really gotten any lead roles. Surprise, surprise, because tenors are the, essentially everyone's a high baritone or a tenor yep. in musicals. I can barely n lurch from the Adams family. There's a bass. <laughs> I can't really name any others. And, yeah. um, and so I didn't really think about singing as something. Um, to do it because my family wasn't um, musical. Uh, like my sister and I would just do musicals sometimes, um, like over the summer. And I was in band uh, since middle school, so I had that side of music. But um, like my mom and my aunt started talking to me and they were like, when my voice really deepened and they're like, you should look into getting voice lessons and uh, to try and sing. And I was like, okay, sure, why not? I wasn't paying for them at the time. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And then I started loving it. And then um, once I started getting into that and being in love with bass, I joined my choir, I joined the music. It was actually funny, one of the musicals I was in, um, I was a villain, and it, but the villain was a tenor part. But um, we planned to drop it the octave. Nice. And so it turned from like this an kind of annoying tenor part to this like basso profundo part, and it was <laughs> it was so much more epic. So that's sick. screenplay writers or or composers, bass villains, they're awesome. Yes. Um, a as you can tell if you've watched Jonathan stuff as well. <laughs> but um, so essentially, when I started falling in love with bass, I just scrounged the internet, scrounged YouTube for like all, anything I could find on bass. I would find all of the, um, like I would find out about like those of you who are in the chat, you probably know some acapella people like Avi Kaplan or Jeff or Tim or just other like gospel bass singers. And I started just like consuming all this information. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, actually that's how I found you, I think. Um, because I was looking up a bunch of uh, vocal range videos and someone made one for you. And I was like, wow, that goes pretty low. That's, new so I checked it out. that's news to me. <laughs> yeah, surprise. I just remembered that right now. Wow, uh, I'm gonna but, have to um, find that sometime. I, I also- oh, it was, it was cool. Man, I'm gonna have to make like an official range video because I, I, because I, obviously we're we're getting into subharmonics now, but I just, I just learned how to do subharmonics after I first started talking to Bobby. That's how recent that was, which was mm. last year we That's started. Probably... Yeah, um, yeah, like end of last year, so, end of 2021. Yeah, so I've added like a full octave to my range since last year. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah it's it's magical isn't it yeah that's like when i got um like sometime last year someone made a vocal range video about me so i was like oh it finally happened and i was like oh this is so magical and yeah. stuff and i was like fanboying out and it was cool yeah. but um when i was searching all these uh deep corners of the internet um this was 2014 or 2015 at the time i came upon this video by a guy named david larson you get some of you in the chat probably know him if you're taking this seminar. And he started talking about this. He only had one video out at the time. He started talking about um, this technique called subharmonic singing. And I was new to singing. I've never heard of that. And uh, I just started, um... wait, did you do that one, Tommy? Did you do Jonathan's or was that someone else? Is, well, is, he'll answer me in the is second. Is the person in your chat who made my range video in your chat? <laughs> <laughs> one of the guys, um, one of the guys who, um, it, he's in the bass gang, Tommy P. 
another bass singer. Okay. Fantastic. He, he said that um, was one of the early. He did it for Caleb things. though. He says he did it for okay. Caleb. <laughs> yes, it was wow. Caleb's that he did it for. Okay, okay. Like some of the first uh, videos he was doing on the internet was um, vocal range videos. And he would do them of like acapella people um, and Caleb. Yeah. And um, uh, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. So subharmonics. Yes. So I found uh, this guy, David Larson, and he was talking about um, subharmonics. And I was like, I don't know what that is. And he showed me this technique. And he and he was kind of he's kind of like a low baritone uh, at the time. Probably his uh, lowest note was probably around like maybe a D or like a C sharp, maybe around there. And he like did this technique and he produced like a solid B. And I was like, yeah, oh, low B. And I was like, oh, I want to do that. And so I started like looking into that and um, I looked around YouTube and it was surprising because literally um, David and probably like. And there was like only like four people on YouTube who knew what subharmonic singing was. Wow. And, and could do it. Like, there was nothing. I was like scraping the barrel just trying to find these videos. And so there was barely any like information on it. There was like no, there was like one, one paper that I read about it like recently that was made about it. But um, it wasn't even in a singing context. But um, so I started like playing around with this technique five years ago. And it took me literally four, maybe like four months to actually be able to produce because I, I was like, I was just starting singing. I was just like trying to find out all these things and it was feeling weird. And then eventually I was able to do it. And so I was like telling voice teachers about it and like choir conductors and they're like, yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Because no one knew what it was. Yeah. There was, um, you'll, you'll be able to find some videos like way back then. There's this guy called Ken Turner from decades ago who used this subharmonic technique, but nobody realized, realized that it was like that kind of technique when it was happening. So he's kind of like a base legend for that. So um, I started like practicing subharmonics and getting like really good at it. And then eventually um, I started meeting like other people who were finding out about it. And then I started posting videos online. I think I have a video posted maybe four years ago of me going down to like a, like a C1, a double low C yeah. in subharmonics. And that was one of my first videos that actually did kind of well. And then so when, I, when TikTok came around recently, summer of 2020 i did some videos with subharmonics and people are like yo what's that because yeah. they didn't know what it was there would be like some people who knew what it was that would be like, wait that's subharmonics you're good at that and they're like teach us and like more and more people are learning about subharmonics and now you'll find a ton of bass singers on tiktok and on youtube who are able to do like subharmonics like uh efficiently proficiently and it's pretty incredible yeah so that's that's kind of how i started out with subharmonics uh do you have any comments on that or anything because uh ne my next thing would be going into oh yeah also my mar for some reason my markers aren't working <laughs> no worries in, no worries but... i am getting exhaustive markers um epic um well my story i think will fit better after we get a little deeper into the different types of subharmonics um, that is, I agree. Yes. So, do you want to surprise? Surprise! There is several different ways yes. to produce subharmonics. And I. So the first thing. Yeah. Yeah. You you go. I I, I want you because I don't know most of this stuff. I know. Uh, just for context, to before we get too deep, uh, I know one technique of subharmonic uh, bass singing, which I correct me if I'm wrong, Bobby is is not the same that you usually use. Um, no. And so one more reason why it's good that both of us are here, uh, because you you carry most of the subharmonic dis discussion and then I chime in just for my <laughs> my weird my weird <laughs> little false fold trick. But um, yeah, so there's a couple different ways to do subharmonic singing, uh, a couple different approaches. Uh, some there are different ways that you can kind of uh, use different vocal techniques to do some of these these vocal kick flips and uh yeah but yeah you take 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 us in bobby i i shall take us in so <laughs> the this uh prepare yourself this discussion i'm about to go into there's going to be um 
there's going to be probably some new stuff that you guys learn. Um, but I'm also going to be talking about a couple of advanced things because a lot of people have been talking about that. Yeah. And kind of the, um, how it happens. So before I go into subharmonic singing, we want to ask the question, what are subharmonics? Not just in a singing context, but what are they in general? Now, um, some of you might know in the chat, uh, and do you know what the harmonic series is? Uh, I refresh my memory. I, I, I've heard the term a lot and I know what harmonics are in the context of music production and instruments. Yes. Um, so essentially that the, the way that harmonics work, the harmonic series is a pattern of a, an infinite pattern of frequencies. And the oh, way yeah. that it's structured is you take a fundamental frequency. I actually, oh, I forgot to set this up. I, I might be able to do this in Logic. I could show um, them on a guitar, too. I could show them guitar harmonics, because that's actually kind of similar to oh, how... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. So, no, 100%. Uh, so, guitar strings... You do that while I pull this up. Yeah, so guitar strings actually work kind of similar... To your vocal cords. Uh, so, when the string uh, when the string is is loose all of the way, uh, it creates a lower sound. And then, uh, when you tighten up on the string, so it's there's there's less room to vibrate. Then what happens? is the string is vibrating faster because it's uh it's constricting it's i mean this is like a science topic and not really uh um but it, it is very important um so the more you constrict the more you shorten the length of what is vibrating uh the more uh the higher the pitch gets but and that's why we talked about earlier that bass singers actually have larger, longer vocal cords. It's like having a longer guitar string, so you can hit mm -hmm. lower notes. Um, and that's why bass guitars are longer than regular guitars, because the string needs to be thicker and longer in order to vibrate to create that lower sound. Now, if you... Uh, if uh, There are things called harmonics where at a, at a certain mathematical point on a guitar string, if you, uh, this is like at the perfect, like one, uh, one third mark on the, uh, or like something like that. It's like a certain mathematical point on the string. If you cause it to vibrate, uh, in a certain way, You create these what are called harmonics, where um, it's it's kind of it, it's literally a it's like a geometry thing because of the exact yeah. because of the exact uh, mathematical part of the string that you are causing to vibrate. It creates like this ghost frequency that represents a completely different um, sound uh, and. I probably didn't do a very good job of explaining that, but there's a science. Can actually, yeah. there's a science to it. So, so bouncing off of that, um, I forgot where I stopped with the harmonic series because I got distracted and wanted to pull something up on Logic, which we'll get to in a second. It's infinite, but um, and yes. it's so all yeah. the different notes is where you got to. Yeah. <laughs> so the okay. Perfect. So the way that it works is the pattern's based off of what's called the fundamental frequency. So if we take like um, a musical pitch at 100 hertz, which is probably something in the second octave for you music fans out there, the harmonic series pattern is essentially taking that fundamental frequency and multiplying it by every whole number. So the first harmonic would be the fundamental because that's one times one or 100 times one, that's the first harmonic. The second harmonic is 200 hertz, third is 300, four, fourth is 400, it goes on and on, keep going up 100 and 100, um, because 
you're just multiplying by whole numbers. And essentially that pattern is in, it happens in nature. Like you just saw with Jonathan's guitar, whenever you pluck a string, um, it's not just playing that note, whatever, um, E at like 120 Hertz or whatever. It's playing a series, an infinite series of pitches, those upper frequencies or harmonics that are like mathematically the ratios and stuff right. like that. So if it's I, that part to explain, if me. I, if I may chip in here, uh, I'll, many of you in the chat, th this is like, I'm trying to kind of explain this, uh, for people that don't understand how like scales work i guess uh many of you have, have heard the word octave before uh yes. so many of you know that uh it, you can you can play one note and then you can play that exact same note but higher mm -hmm. and a lot of people know what that you, your brain automatically can tell that that's the same note but higher quote unquote like you're your brain hears that naturally, but the reason why your brain registers that as the same note but higher is because your brain is smarter than you think, and your brain can tell that the frequency of this higher note is exactly double the frequency of this lower note. So... And and because all of this is exists in nature, it's hard to see on, on my camera here, especially if you're in Bobby's stream, I apologize. But uh, this point right here is exactly halfway up the guitar string. So math, so, so this is literally all like laws of nature. Yes. So if you div if you cause this string to vibrate at exactly twice the frequency that it normally does, your brain can hear that. And all of the other notes that we use are di are fractions and divisions of that 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 your brain can mathematically tell that th it's like it's like seeing like the golden ratio in nature or whatever it's like when you see a beautiful flower and it's symmetrical your brain can hear symmetry in sounds so that's like the yeah. that, that, that that's the way to explain that for people that don't know anything about music yes and um as he was saying the actually going into the octaves thing when i was talking about harmonics and um Whenever you have a vibrating body, like your vocal folds or a guitar string or a drum, I don't know, anything else that vibrates, it vibrates in that series. So like, you think you're just hearing like one pitch when I go, uh, but there's actually that series, that harmonic series of pitches, the pitches you can't really hear, but they have a certain loudness and intensity that you can tell the characteristic of my voice with that that was kind of poorly explained but the reason why if i sing a note on ah uh, and jonathan sings a note on ah uh, you could tell who is who is singing which one because our harmonics and our voices are different like volumes at certain harmonics and if you can hear let me see if my piano's working yes so the harmonic um pattern if we're going um if we're starting from, we'll just say this is the fundamental frequency. Can you hear that, by the way, Jonathan? Or uh, can you yeah, still not? I can. I can. Okay. So it goes. Then second harm. That's the first harmonic. Second harmonic is the octave up. Third harmonic is the fifth above that. Fourth harmonic is the that next octave, which is a fourth above the fifth that I just played. And then it keeps going. The third. Then the. Yep off and off into infinity and yeah. essentially all those pitches that are in our voices or in our guitars give them their distinct tone now i had a point to this oh also if you guys are fans of that um you might know what overtone singing is and essentially overtone singing is changing like you know when you take a bottle and do take the cap off and blow into it and it vibrates at a resonant frequency like if you go to and it goes yeah when you like blow across a bottle so y with overtone singing you're kind of doing that with your mouth so you change the um your tongue shape and the position of it in your mouth 
to resonate those upper frequencies. So you, you, you might be able to hear it right here. Let me try. Oh, wow. Uh, d d Discord thought that that was background noise. As soon as you flipped into the, <laughs> as soon as you flipped into the overtone, Discord thought it was background noise. <laughs> yeah. It's not a natural person speaking. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, essentially, yeah, I'm just changing. Um, so if I actually found a note here, that first harmonic, can you kind of hear the harmonic? I can't hear it at all. Kind of Discord is legitimately filtering it. Can you like, can you just like hit record in logic and then just drop me the, uh, drop me like a quick little MP3? <laughs> sure. Uh, I, you know what? I actually, you know, do you have the, the full version of Melodyne has this thing on it that oh, yeah. it will, um, you can actually turn up and down the harmonics in yeah, your the, voice the, or in a guitar. Yeah, the polyphonic. The DNA thing. Uh, yeah. The polyphonic uh, algorithm or whatever. Yeah. 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 But essentially, when I do overtone singing and I'm like going up in the scale, just like... That's that's going up the harmonic series. I'm just resonating those upper pitch, those upper pitches that you can't necessarily hear. We'll we'll have so, to we'll have to get you do to do that into your phone later and send it to me so I can put it in my clip. <laughs> no, hundred percent. I'm gonna I'll I'll professionally record this and like yeah. do all this stuff after. Yeah, and no we'll add it on. No worries. But um, so what does this have to do with subharmonics? Now harmonics, subharmonics. They both have the word harmonics in there, so they're kind of related. Now the way that it works is the harmonic series is that um, I actually have a picture right here. Um, that I drew like last year. Some of you may find it familiar, but do you do you see? Uh, come on, filter. I know it's a very bright light. Uh, focus, focus. Uh, but you can tell it's like um, a treble clef, and those um, there are no. Don't copy. You see those notes going up, and how it gets closer and closer. That's the harmonic series. Now the subharmonic series is if you take that whole series, that pattern of frequencies, and flip it upside down. So instead of uh, a note, and it's the then it goes an octave up, then then the next octave, whatever, it goes down. So it goes down an octave, down a fifth. So it's a, essentially mirroring the pattern of the harmonic series. So take the harmonic series, the pattern for that, instead of whole number multiples of the fundamental frequency, it's whole number divisions. Oh, that's stretching. It's a whole number of divisions of the sub of the harmonic series. So, um, I'm actually going to pull up a notes thing because I had what I was going to say next on it. So, uh, ch 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 so yeah, you. How do you create? Yeah, uh, is that? there a is there a noise reduction in your Discord settings in addition to the noise suppression? Because that might Let fix me it. Double check. Yeah, you might. It, it, uh, I know. I know. We tried the noise. It will, it will be worth it. Yeah, because I, I don't want it to pick up as subharmonic says. <laughs> yeah, as noise either. Yeah. Uh, so there dude, is okay. uh, uh, noise suppression and then noise reduction. If you scroll down to voice processing at the bottom of the voice and video settings. Uh, noise reduction is turned off. Okay. Uh, I have advanced voice activity. Wait, that's turned off as well. Echo cancellation. And then noise suppression uh, if you scroll up. Uh, let me see. Noise. I did see noise suppression. Oh, that's on. That's okay, why. yep. Turn that off and then do the overtone thing again and it should work. Oh, nope. It's still not working. How there it is. There it is. Can you get a little oh, bit? Wait, it was doing. Yeah, it was work. Like try if, just turn up the turn up the gain on your interface a little bit and get a little closer to the mic if you can. Okay. Oh, now it's not working again. Okay, we'll just add it in that. Yeah, we'll, we'll worry about um, it later. Anyway, uh, oh, uh, turn off automatic sensitivity. Um, yeah, try okay, try turn. Sorry, Tommy yeah, just added in. Yeah, try turning off the. Uh, uh, turn off the auto. Uh, yeah, automatically determine input sensitivity near the top. Um, okay. 
Okay. Try turning that Perfect. off. Perfect. And then. Okay, I turn that off. Okay, now do how, it. How do I sound now? Okay. <laughs> Take seven. Yeah. But you can kind of hear those pictures. Did it work that time? Yes, it did. Cool. We fixed it. So. And this is so harm. This is similar yeah. to like Mongolian whistle. Uh, yeah, exactly. Harmonic singing. That's you, that's what they do yeah. in um, in uh, Mongolian singing. Mongolian throat singing is yes. they change the position of their tongue in their mouth so it resonates those upper frequencies. Now, how does a subharmonic work? What is a subharmonic? So we just talked about how subharmonic the subharmonic series is the inverse of the harmonic series. So it's the uh, fundamental frequency divided by two. That's the first subharmonic below, which is an octave below. So whenever you hear us sing uh, subharmonics, uh, it's exactly an octave below because that is the first subharmonic. And we'll get into going further down the series with subharmonic singing in a second. But it brings the question, how is the subharmonic created? Now, it is created by two pitches, two or more pitches, interfering with each other and essentially do you know what uh constructive and destructive interference is uh so in, in concept i i i know the music production angle to this yeah about how you can flip the basic uh, man this is a weird thing to explain but um if uh let me see if i can pull up a like a, a little sketch pad here yes um uh, also, thank you, Tommy, for fixing that problem for us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, while he pulls that up, essentially, um, when you take two pitches and they're a certain ratio apart from each other, they can interfere in a certain way that produces an undertone or a subharmonic. So let's take, um, how do you get the first subharmonic? So... What you do is you have to look at uh, the ratio um, between a two to three ratio, if that makes sense. But first, let me say, if you take a note, hopefully you can hear that. Yes. Oh, does the piano work now? Yes, it's working perfectly Fantastic. now. Awesome. So let's take a note and let's take the fifth above it. So the note and then the fifth above it. Now, when you think about notes in general, like sine waves and stuff like that, it's just vibrations. Um, that's that's the frequency that gives the frequency, it's the hertz. So yeah. if you just slow the, down the vibration, the pitch will go down because the hertz is changing. So it'll go down and go down until, like, if you super, super slow it down, you'll just hear clicking like... This is This is the perfect time for me to explain this. Go wild. Okay. So, Bobby, stop me if I do this wrong. Yes. Um, but this is this is kind of a... It's, we kind of have to get deep into the mad scientist tank here. Um, oh, yeah. So, when you hear a sound wave... Uh, you probably aren't going to be able to see this, Bobby, sadly. But... Uh, that is okay. Uh, when you see a sound wave, it's actually vibrating air and that vibrating air looks like this and what you're hearing is actually the air vibrating like that it'll it'll vibrate um one way and then it'll vibrate the other way right i'll and, try and pull up a picture too yeah and and what bobby is describing here about frequencies clashing with each other and creating new notes is um, is when you have more than one frequency. So this is one frequency, and the frequency you measure how far each of the ripples are. The like the name of the actual frequency is just measuring. Yeah, Bobby's pulling up a picture here. Yep, that's a sound wave. 
And so when you actually measure how fast this wave is, that's the frequency of that sound. So every note that gets higher or lower, the higher notes will have a higher frequency because these, these waves are closer together, right? Yep. Um, and, and lower notes more quickly. Yes. And, and lower notes will have a lower frequency, um, because the waves are slower. Um, so then what Bobby's describing here about, uh, subharmonics and about, uh, pitches interacting with each other is if you have a faster wave that represents this, um, more frequently wavy line, uh, this, uh, these two frequencies that are waving at different speeds are going to collide with each other in certain key places. And like, you see like right here, but there's a moment where both of these waves are going one way. And then there's a moment here where both of these waves are going the other way right here. Uh, you know, like there, so there's, there's valleys and mountains that these two, these two lines share with each other mathematically. And because they're both at a constant speed, those waves are going to collide with each other in a predictable spot. Like ev every, every so many waves, they'll line up with each other. But to you, that's all happening in like a millisecond. These waves are, are you know, yes. waving, at, waving at all of these different speeds. But when those waves collide with each other like that at a predictable spot, which you can, you can predict here if I, kept, if I drew a very long wave uh, that was perfectly measured, which this is not. But um, if uh, your brain can kind of hear that, your brain can naturally hear that these sound waves are colliding with each other. And it perceives that as kind of a whole new wave, sort of. That, am, I, am I describing that right? No, 100%. Okay. Because yeah. when we look at those two waves colliding, like you were saying, there are certain points where those creases meet and those valleys meet. So when they meet, that part of those two waves colliding will be louder. Yeah. So when it's louder... It's uh, it's obviously since they're only meeting at in certain parts, certain repeating parts, it's going to create a frequency because it's in that pattern and the pre frequency is going to be lower. So if we take the root and we take the fifth above it, we can kind of simplify it a little bit. So if you look up the ratio, like the mathematical ratio of a root and a fifth, it's two to three. So every two times every two vibrations the root note has the fifth above it vibrates three times so if you super 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 slow it down to the point where you can hear the individual vibrations uh you're a drummer jonathan i am so you know some uh you know some like syncopation and some polyrhythms yes uh polyrhythms oh wow word, not syncopation this is a very so good way to you... explain this bobby this is Mm. Yeah, I have thought deeply about this. <laughs> I can <So> tell. <laughs> if you've, um, if you take that uh, root and fifth, that two to three ratio, and slow it down, it's essentially just a two to three polyrhythm like this. Yeah. Now, if you notice, one of them, the is my snapping like loud enough? Yes. Yes. Okay. So like. That's the root. Yeah. And then the fifth is. Yeah. So every. So they're both happening. Yeah. So every two yes. snaps, every two snaps on this hand and every three snaps on this hand. They snap at the same time. Yeah. They collide. And so. And think of that like the collide, sound waves. Think of that like the sound waves instead of snaps. Yeah, exactly. And so if we uh, look at those, um, when they collide, when it creates that constructive frequency, when they're snapping at the same time, we just look at it in relation to, let's just say one of the pitches. So um, the root note again, 
it's happening every other time, so it's skipping a beat. So instead of it's yep. So so, it, so it's the octave. Exactly, yeah. it's the octave lower since it's half of its frequency. So um, that's that's essentially why I was gonna bring in, um, and it was very cool that you saw what was coming. Um, <laughs> yeah. When uh, when you have uh, two frequencies combined. Oh, okay. So also tell me if you can hear this from Logic. Uh, uh, do you have it? Yes, I was just gonna say. Do you have a sine wave generator? <laughs> oh yeah, that's what I was preparing. Yes. So. Uh, if we take a pitch at 200 hertz, that's the note, and then do a pitch at uh, 300 hertz, so two to three ratio, two to three, 200 to 300, that's uh, the fifth. Let's have an octave up. So you can hear them both individually, but what happens if you play them at the same time? Now I'm gonna turn on the fifth. Now it might be a little hard to hear, but you can kind of hear. Oh, stop, don't play. You can kind of hear an undertone there. Yep. It might be better if you don't have headphones on in certain cases, but. That's a pure sound wave happening. as well, to those of you that don't know how that works. That's like the. the uh, other other sound waves are kind of like uh, inconsistent yeah, full and, of and, and and jagged sometimes. But what what Bobby's using to demonstrate this is is a, that's a sine wave, just a straight sine wave, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's so like literally a pure wave. Just that those loops that we showed you, or not the loops, the waves that we showed you. Yes, and they're they're like completely smooth because they don't have any harmonics in them. So it's very easy to only hear the pure tone. And um, so that's how subharmonics are created. You just, it's just two different pitches that are colliding, creating this interference, uh, creating an undertone, like that louder frequency and undertone. And that's how it happens. So, uh, oh, we have a question. Uh, so when you're doing a first subharmonic, you're creating a fifth above with your false folds. So now the thing about um, the subharmonics that I do um, and Johnny does as well, uh, mostly, um, is that it only involves uh, your true vocal cords. So your true vocal cords are what you use to talk, sing like, ha, ah, ah. that's all your true vocal cords. Now there's your false vocal cords right above it that are thicker, and you can hear them when you're going, <clears throat> like you're coughing, ah, yep. ah just like that and you'll hear them kind of like coming together or if you're and really so, really angry at someone yeah so you have a yes you, you have a you have a separate set of muscles a separate set of muscles what are they above or below two thick boys uh they're above yeah so you you have a separate set of muscles called your false vocal cords which are a completely separate set of muscles that are not designed to be creating sounds the way that you're your normal vocal cords are, but you still can move them. The, the uh, you can still like constrict, you can still tighten them and loosen them. And uh, so there, one of the ways that we're going to talk about to do this, you tighten your false vocal cords to get them to vibrate with the air that you're pushing through your throat to create that other frequency that Bobby's talking about mm -hmm. to, to clash. Um, yeah, but now, I, one I'm, thing I want to, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm, I'm really curious to hear your explanation about how to do, uh, true vocal cord subs, because I actually do not oh, know yes. how to do that. Um, one of, um, one of my, uh, actually it is Marcelo base. One of the guys in the chat. Um, he asked a question, what's the ratio for the second and third subharmonic? So when we were talking about that first subharmonic, take do. It's the octave below. If we look at the subharmonic series, that's the first subharmonic below it. You have the fundamental, then the subharmonic below, which is the octave. But there's still that pattern that's the opposite of the harmonic series. So, like the harmonic series is the root, then an octave above, then a fifth above that. So, if we're looking at the subharmonic series, it's the root, 
the octave below that, then a fifth below that. That's the second subharmonic. So the, the way is so essentially it the would thir the you'll, third you'll, would be the third, right? Uh, I think it would be the third would be because it would be the third like would be or wait the octave. Oh, or okay, I'll just, yeah. I'll just Sorry. say this: it will make it will, yeah. it will make more sense. So if you're singing this note, the first subharmonic would be that note below it, and the second one would be yep the fifth below it. Yep. So you'll really be singing this note. But it would the way that the frequencies would happen would produce this note for the second subharmonic. So Marcella asked, "What's the ratio for it?" So we looked at um, the root and a fifth that has the two to three ratio. The interference between that creates the first subharmonic. Now, uh, through just like doing some math in my head a while ago, trying to figure out what ratio is the second one, it's um, it's the difference not between the root. And the fifth, which is the first, the second one would be a root and a fourth. So if you look at the ratio between a root and the fourth, it's a three to four ratio. So by three to four, every time one of them is vibrating, one of them vibrate, the root vibrates three times. The, um, every time, reset. Every time <laughs> the root vibrates three times, the fourth above it vibrates four times. Right. So. Uh, it's, what's what's the poly? So if we slow that down again, go back into polyrhythm snapping. It's yes, uh, I think it's like yep, one, two. Oh my! It's see me I, trying to count. It's, is that is that four four over five? Is that what that I is? I think that's four over three. It's two, two, three, two, two, two. one, two, yeah. three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, two, yeah. That's three. four, three. and the other one's doing four. Yeah. Um. So. When you slow that down, or not slow that down, we already slowed it down. So when you think about that polyrhythm, again, we want to think about when the two snaps meet. So, yeah. So the um, actually, wait, was it? Yes. So when the um, root is vibrating three times, the um, fourth vibrates four times, and then they'll meet. Yeah. And then they'll go through their cycle again, and every Every three times for the root, they'll meet. Every four times for the um, for the fourth, we'll meet. Right. So, so the, when we, the important yeah. thing, uh, so, uh, sorry. So, some people in my chat are like, "I'm completely lost now." Don't worry about it. I, I the, don't blame them. The <laughs> the important thing, the important thing about this is what Bobby's explaining is that you're 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 using your voice to create two notes at the same time, and those notes interacting with or two or more actually uh and uh and those two notes if you pick them correctly will then merge to create a very low note together uh that's the Bingo. that's the simple version of what we're talking about so so what bobby is is get is digging into right now is how do you know which two notes to pick in order to create a certain target note that you want to hit. So that mm -hmm. that's like a very complicated math question, but um, it, you're yeah, this was the advanced yeah, part yeah. I was talking about. Earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the important thing is uh, you, you're not going to be doing a math equation every time that you sing this. You're going to be feeling it. You're going to be feeling yes. the, 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 how you're creating those two notes and it will, once it works, those two notes will immediately merge together and you'll hear this hybrid <clears throat> low uh, undertone that the these different frequencies you're creating with your throat creates. Um, so it sounds very exactly. complicated, but it's actually super simple. We're making an yeah, extra just... frequency, which then, uh, yeah, continue. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just, I'm just like, like if you look at your iPhone, I'm just explaining the uh, everything that happens underneath the hood. Yeah. So this is not stuff that you have to know. This is just for some curious minds in the chat because it all happens automatically. I'm just yes. telling you, uh, as Jonathan was saying, uh, what's happening under the hood. Um, so then just wrapping up the three to four, the um, second subharmonic. Yes. Uh, if you take a root and a fourth 
and you look at the thing, the da 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 da. When do they meet? So every four times or every three times the root vibrates and every four times the fourth vibrate, they meet. So uh, we don't really want to break down a three into a fraction. So if we look at the fourth, which is every four vibrations, it's meeting every four vibrations. Which is, so, a, which is a longer space. It's a longer mm -hmm. space than every time that the one or that the two and the three meet. Instead, it's four and three, and it takes longer for them to meet back up again, which means that those meeting points create a longer sound wave. And like we said before, the longer the sound wave, the lower the note. Exactly. Yeah. So if we look at that root and fourth again, this note, if we take that, um, imagine as four and divide it, uh, how do you get like, so you're just dividing it twice. So it's one fourth of it, one fourth the frequency. And when yes. it's one fourth the frequency, it's two octaves down because you're taking a note, divide it by two and then divide it by two again which yep. is essentially dividing it by four. So when we look at that note, two octaves below it would sound like, and that's the second subharmonic because you have the root, first subharmonic, second subharmonic, there we go. So I think that that's my, I, I just finished my rant of the ratios. Yeah. Um, but but uh, obviously the subharmonic series keeps going down. More and more complicated videos. Sorry, I'm not going to explain. Happen. Um, and so it brings us back to the point: is it needs to be vibe. It needs two pitches to create a subharmonic. So how's that happening in your two vocal folds? Now, um, I, I've talked uh, there. There, of course, because. Of course there are. There's a bunch of like base group chats and base Facebook groups that I'm in. So we like actually talk about this a lot. And um, I had some people like send um, uh, like papers about this stuff, what goes on inside. So what um, what we uh, think, what we theorize is happening in your two vocal cords. So if you like take a look, take a little uh, camera up your nose and shove it into your throat to see your vocal cords, you just see like two flaps and um, they'll meet and it'd be better to have a picture, but essentially they'll meet in like vibration really fast. And that's how it produces the note. Now, the way that we theorize that it happens is they vibrate irregularly. So one side is vibrating um, three times every time the other side is vibrating two times when it's producing the subharmonic. What? That's yes. insane. That that is that is the topmost theory of how this happens. How, so obviously, when they meet, when the two to three ratio meets, that's when your vocal cords connect, producing that vibration. That's insane. Yeah. Which One side is, is vibrating differently? It's literally insane. Yeah. Like, you know how like that's people can crazy. have like vocal cord paralysis. One is free. One is like doesn't work. The other one works. Uh, it's not that severe, but they vibrate irregularly. And wow. there's like pictures in this um, this paper that I read and they took like slow. Uh, they somehow took like not like stop motion, but essentially slowed down the footage to see the individual vibrations. And, and it's like the vocal cords are doing like a little dance. It's 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 weird because they're vibrating irregularly. And so obviously when those two meet, it produces that undertone because they're meeting at a slower ratio. That's insane. That it's, is crazy. It's pretty crazy. Wow. Now, shout out to whoever wrote that paper, by the way. Thank you. But um, that that's essentially how you create subharmonics only using your true vocal folds. And yeah, so that's that's what this sounds like. Uh, I don't. I'll see if I can do the second subharmonic, but I don't know if I can. You usually have to go higher because it's going to be super, super low note. But if I can't, then I'll pull up a video on my iPhone and just play it in. Uh, oh, do you kind of hear it? I, there? I heard like, it for a second. Uh, you'll hear the uh, 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 yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, I heard it. I so heard I'm it. Still singing that note. I'm still yep. singing that note, that initial note, but it goes down to the first harmonic, subharmonic, then the second one. David Larson is fantastic at doing this, the going down to the second subharmonic, because it obviously it's like learning subharmonics again. It's which I'll talk about in a second. It's uh, very hard to do, uh, coming from a person who has done subharmonics a lot. It is very hard to do, and then by just. I'll explain how to do it later, but um, you can just keep going down. Yeah. I heard someone go. Oh, actually, I had a, I have a video that will blow some of your minds. It's essentially uh, this guy named Leonard Fuchs, and I think that's how you pronounce his last name. If not, I apologize, Leonard. He's not watching this, but yeah. Um, so anyway, he was able down to get down to the fourth subharmonic. And it may sound like this is um, like auto tune at first, but it's just like you could kind of hear it with my voice how it clicks. It clicks right down. So uh, I pulled up the video right here. I can play the YouTube video bad, on my YouTube end bad. as well. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll text the. Do you want me to text it to yeah, you? Yeah, just text me the link. Okay. Yeah. So send that. Now this is. So this is not altered in any way. This is just a recording of his voice. And after he gets to the lowest one, you can hear him quickly, like, just go back up. So here it is. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm playing it here. So that's wow. something I'll never be able to do. I don't know how he can do it with like such ease. Well, he uh, well he actually practices me, this, is, this stuff. Let me play this yeah. one more. Let me play this second half here one more time so people can hear that flip. I'll stay quiet. Yeah. Hold on, I'm gonna play it one more time because I was on the wrong camera angle. Sorry. <laughs> that is okay. Wow. Okay, that's crazy. That's that's one of my videos that I made a couple years ago, and actually, I'm gonna send it. Um, I'll send it uh, to. Um, I'll post it in the chat. Yeah. And also, uh, someone said he was sharp on the last note. The reason why is because with this technique, you're you're kind of changing the space in between your vocal folds, vocal cords. So your pitch in that original note, original note is going to vary a little bit. So that's why it's sometimes sharp or sometimes flat. But um, I will quickly post that thingy in the chat. Um, but it, while I'm doing that, if you had any other uh, comments about that, because it's insane. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I, uh, I want to hear, I want to hear your your explain like I'm five for how to do that or how to do the first one. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so uh, wait, actually, let me copy this. Yeah, first. I don't, I don't really have much to contribute until we get to false folds, and then. Uh, you know, I'm kind of the, I'm I'm the barbarian out in out in no man's land doing <laughs> false chord subharmonics. <laughs> but, no, but no, I'm actually uh, I'm actually so glad you're here though because you're um you you're really great at explaining because sometimes I'm poor at explaining things, but you're great at <laughs> simplifying it to where uh not crazy bass person would understand. Um, thank you. So I uh, thank you for that. Do, doing my best. <laughs> so uh, right here, right here is the marker for how to do subharmonics. Okay, I'm putting it down. Okay. <clears throat> and so there's a disclaimer. Remember what I said. It took me th three, three or four months to actually be able to produce this technique. So sometimes it does take time to find the right placement and the right like to build up that muscle. Uh, but there's other people like, uh, yes, girls can also do it. I've had this friend that I taught it. And on the first day, 
she was able to reach the second subharmonic. And I was like, well, I guess I'll just quit now. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, well, that was incredible first. But um, uh, so essentially, the way that you do it, I wrote down some notes here for me that I wrote a while ago. Uh, first of all, what you want to do is warm up your voice. If you're not a singer, uh, whatever we said like hours ago yeah. applies. Do not try um, this unless you are an experienced singer. Because, yes, because this, you, this yes. is a very advanced technique. I don't know how to do this yet, and I've been singing all my life with a, surrounded by a lot of uh, singers that have taught me a lot of tricks. So... And, mm -hmm. and like Bobby said, most voice coaches and most uh, throat doctors don't know how this works. Bobby's talking about something where there's only one paper that thinks it knows how this is actually <laughs> happening with your own muscles. This is like one of those things where they haven't completely figured out how the brain works. It's kind of yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> so we are, this is the part of the video where this is a very advanced theoretical vocal technique. Do not try this at home unless you are an experienced singer. Be safe. There's our disclaimer. Mm. Now, the way that this technique works as every health, as every legitimate singing technique works it won't have it won't hurt your voice if you um if you're doing it right it won't hurt your voice been doing this five years never hurt my voice with it um the reason that i warn you is because some people do it wrong and they sometimes they clench up their throat a lot more than they should well you shouldn't like clench it up like that but like yeah. and they could end up damaging their voice so essentially um what you want to do after just warm up your voice if you have uh do, you don't want to practice too much because your voice can, in the first day because your voice can get a little bit fatigued if you try and so we're going for the first octave the first subharmonic the easiest one the the baby that gets you all the money that octave lower <laughs> note it's yep. awesome now so one of the main uh, problems, uh, because when you were seeing when I did it earlier, I was hitting a note and then using this technique to hit the octave lower. What people do the first time, that's a problem, they try and do it t so low, like too low in their chest range. Like some, some people try and like, blah, try and like sing a low C and then do subharmonics with it. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to do that. Try and find your lowest comfortable note. I'll just say for me, like, blah. I'll just say it's a low C. Yeah. And then go about a fifth up from that, like a fifth to an octave. Yeah. So any anywhere around like in, in that range, the fifth to an octave above it. Yep. Like literally I started this technique on an A2. Blah. That was the only note I was able to produce with subharmonics for the first time. So don't pick a super low note uh aim higher uh as a safeguard so i'll 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 just be using that a2 it's like a sixth above uh to whatever my lowest chest note is so you take that note and the thing about it sometimes it can sound loud but you but it's it's not using a lot of air so like literally when i do subharmonics and hold my hand right here i can barely feel my air touching like my um my hand Yep. You don't want to use a lot of air. Now, the way that you do it is you just blah, sing, relax. You really want to relax your voice. Are you so in soft palate when you do that? Uh, what's that? Are you in soft Sorry, palate when you do that? Uh, you can be, but I just have like, I'm not like open up and just, I'm just relaxed. Because mm. it's easier to have like a closed, like to have less space in your mouth i know we were talking about resonance earlier but for subharmonics it's easier to do it on like closed vowels like e or a with like your soft palate not raised with like not a lot of space around do, and once you get better at that what's that oh do, do you mind if i try this along with you as you're doing no, of this course. <laughs> okay and the thing is people are like uh so but if it's just but if you're doing like starting off soft what well, i want it to be louder Practice the soft first, and then once you're good at that, you'll build the muscle memory. Then you can start playing around with like vowel shapes and like raising your soft palate and stuff, so you can really make it a little bit louder. 
So first practice soft. So like literally. Uh, very light. And now the second thing I have um, an analogy that I'm going to go into is in a second. So you want to relax your voice. Don't use a ton of air. Like I said, imagine your airflow in pitch going in a straight line forward. You try not to change your pitch while you're doing this next part. Mm -hmm. So you want to experiment closing your vocal cords slightly without changing the pitch. You don't want to slide down. People usually that I see doing it wrong go like, uh, and then they like change the position of their vocal cord so that they're then singing a lower note. You want to stay on that note. So, uh, so we're not frying. We're kind of frying. Okay. Because if I, if I do this, uh, uh, I'm not like, uh, I'm right. not like sliding down right. to vocal fry because vocal fry can happen in any part of your vocal range. Right. Like, do you want to explain? Like why some do you want to explain very briefly what frying is, so that we're yes, yeah, because that Good that <laughs> that is very important here. So, uh, so yes. I like I can maybe like, like so if, if you try to hit a low note and you can't, uh, and your voice kind of like flickers like that, that's called vocal frying, and it. Yeah. Like Bobby sang, it, you can do that at any part of your range. And again, if you're a very experienced singer, you should be able to kind of flip into... Uh, uh, like wh wherever you are, you should know how to kind uh, of, you know. And that yeah. is... A, that uh, Somebody asked this in the chat. I'm not going to get into this because I don't know how to do this. But that is one way to scream, to do metal screams, yes. is by using that part of your vocal cords. Yeah, I actually have my roommate from college is um, uh, he was actually he was the other singer and he did a, like just about all the instruments for the crucified cover that I sent yeah, you a yeah. while ago. But he's um, he's a metal singer and he's great. He's great at he learned fry fry screaming first and he was great at it. Um, maybe I'll make a little thing like this with him. Yeah. But, um, so, yeah, vocal fry is essentially when you're singing in chest voice like ah, like your your vocal folds are like vibrating at a pitch in there at a frequency that's you know just a pattern it's not like interrupted or anything it's consistent and when you slide down into fry like uh here out it's kind of like just random like sputtering so that's that's kind of what vocal fry is it's just like it's not supported by your chest range it's just you're pushing your vocal cords together and just loosely pushing air out of them so they're just going like so they're just like kind of jumbling about producing random clicks and pops and so, stuff. So we're singing so, yeah. we're singing like an A or something and we're you said we're kind of frying it. Yes. So, so the way it works is vocal fry when you're singing in chest, your your uh, vocal cords are like vibrating like this. Now when you go to fry, you kind of push them together like uh like they're pushing together. I'm not straining like uh, yeah. I'm just lightly uh, uh, just put it pushing them together. Uh, so you can kind of hear from. Uh, oh, sorry, I was you can to kind it. of hear from. No, that's okay. Um, <laughs> this might make a little bit of sense. So essentially, from like regular chest voice, uh, complete vocal fry mm. push together. Uh, so if you hear me go start to close it, I'll I'll try and visualize it here. It's, yep. it's hard not to. Can you still see my hands? Uh, move closer over your face. Otherwise, I can I can move you like this. Yeah. Okay. So essentially, they're vibrating. Uh, you you kind of heard the subharmonic there, yep. but I fully closed my vocal cords. Yeah. I'll do it again. Uh, I'm still standing, staying on that pitch, like not moving my vocal position at all while closing my vocal folds. So it's not completely closed like your vocal frying. You're just slightly, slightly I get closing it, it I to get add it. a tiny bit of like that, how it feels to add vocal fry, just a tiny bit, just going. Uh, just slight. Oh, imagine I get it, it. the analogy that I had is um, imagine uh, like a garden hose like, you know, with the circular spout that just sprays water out of it. Yeah. Now, um, 
Imagine water coming out of it. The water is your airflow, so it's consistent. You're not changing the water coming out of it at all. Now, you know how you can press your thumb over it and it like pressurizes so the water shoots out super fast and far? Yep. Yeah, so that's what you're doing, except imagine like your thumb is your vocal folds pressing against your airflow, like completely closing it off is going to ca cause that fry like... Uh, I can hear it now because it's like pressurized and yeah. stuff you're just slightly slightly putting your thumb over where the water's coming out just the side of it so that it pressurizes just a little yeah. so it's just going uh, just slightly wow. over it so that is impressive well, thank my you, friend thank you. and <laughs> to the people in the chat who might not fully understand this, um, what what Bobby's explaining, right? He's doing a beautiful job of explaining this, uh, like putting your thumb on a garden hose, but you can see your thumb and you can just put it in the right spot on the garden hose. You can't see your vocal co cords. So what <laughs> Bobby's explaining is he has to learn the exact muscle memory to know what it feels like to to push his throat together or his, his vocal cords together uh, exactly the right amount to to do that, but not too far that it uh, does that, right? And that's yeah, I, that takes practice. That's it's <laughs> it's like when you see I don't know why I thought of this, but it's like when you see like professional Counter Strike players and they they or or what like Fortnite players and they'll just like boom like click on somebody's head they'll just like swoop, click and then like yep. it, it's an exact yeah. headshot perfectly it's like that that's kind of what bobby is doing with his vocal cords he knows how to immediately get the headshot and put his put his vocal cords in, in <laughs> get it, the it, headshot. yeah, get, yeah. It, he knows how to immediately click in, in, into that part without needing to and that's i imagine that's why it took you months to learn how to do it is because you have to you have to yeah he's, you know, try to click exactly. on on people's heads for four months until you can do it on first try. Yeah, until you do it right, and then you can just do it with muscle memory. And I actually just remembered, um, I posted this video on TikTok a little while ago, but um, I found a video on Snapchat because, like, Snapchat memories pop up. I recorded it on there five years ago, and it reminded me, hey, today was when you tried subharmonics or something. Yeah. When I first was able to get it, I have this video of me trying to, like, consistently hold... Um, that, that I think it was it was probably that a that I was going with uh, so this is what I sounded like trying to sustain a subharmonic like one of the first days I was able to actually produce it uh, turn up okay uh... so you notice I kind of like got it and held on to it there at the yeah. end but then but the Trouble is just trying to find that right position, that right like closure point. Yeah, which uh, that's the magic. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Oh, actually, let me see where I was on my notes. Let me uh, let me do, try do, it really do. quick while you're looking at your notes, and I'll make a fool yes. of myself here. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> uh... Oh man, it's so weird using that little air. I feel like I I don't know how to. How to do half frying like that? Oh man! Uh, uh, and I'm going into soft, soft palate instinctively. You can, you can uh, even try and go into like a breathier place. Like, uh, uh, oh man, yeah, I, I, I'm completely lost on how to get that half closed like that. So try and just completely close it like vocal fry. Uh, completely go into vocal fry on that note. Uh, 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 oh, I, 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 I yeah, get it now. Yeah. I get it now. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. 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 I get it. I get it. See, you yeah. know, you know how it feels yeah, now. You yeah. Know yeah. Yeah. Once you just keep exploring <clears throat> that place, and you'll be able to find that. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I'm going too tight. I'm going too tight right away. Yep. Yeah. Uh, 
and think about it like this you don't want to like as i said earlier it's just like lightly lightly compressing you're not uh, you're not pushing or anything there's no pushing you're just oh i heard it for a second i heard it for yeah, a second i heard it yep it happened oh yeah it was there again oh man i'm gonna be doing this all try, day <laughs> try, try a higher note like <laughs> Maybe try that. Uh, 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 oh. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Voice crack. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, like that's yeah, how yeah. Light you want to I'm gonna I'm gonna it. split the difference. That note feels really high. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> you can even try lower if you want. Uh, Up to you. Uh, I'm, I, I almost instinctively did false chords there. Yeah, I heard it coming out. Oh man, now I can't do it at all. <laughs> but you got the feeling, which is good. And if you see me looking to the side in the thing, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I have a separate monitor I'm looking at, Jonathan, and uh, for you in the chat. Oh man, <laughs> it's weird. It's really weird. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like yeah, it sounds to me like you're yeah, you're almost trying to instinctually go for like the um, the compression of like false yeah. folds. Yeah, but it's not like that. It's very different because you you felt it when you did it earlier. Oh yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's hard for me to make yeah. that distinction between closing the false the false chords and closing the the true chords, the true vocal folds because I've never. I've never done anything in in however many years I've been singing. I've never had a reason to close my true vocal cords that much, you know. So it's like it's like All a right. it's like a new it's a new muscle that I haven't worked out before, you know. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, 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 oh, I'm trying to push too hard. I know, I know it. I can feel I'm trying to push too hard. Yeah, it's, it's, it has to be so light, like you're floating. Yeah, I can, I can, it's so close. It's so close. Yes. I can feel it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just think about calming, soft. You don't want to, uh, don't want to do that. Just, uh, just think about that like light vocal fry, not the fry that's like, uh, like the, uh, like try, try doing a sigh, like, uh, uh. for one second, try and do, um, oh, I heard do it. a sigh with me, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like uh, into vocal fry, like uh, 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 even that's a little the yeah. um, fry there sounds a little aggressive, just like uh, 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 like you're literally no pressure, uh, like that, yeah, yeah, like that, and then try and get that same feeling, and then try and do. even lighter with it. I think that's it. No, I think that was Fry. <laughs> that was it. Oh man, that's so weird. That's yeah. crazy. You, you actually, you actually could hear the second subharmonic. Like when you you did you did the uh, <laughs> first one for a little bit there. Yeah. Um. To, to, my my subharmonic ears are very yeah, very yeah. sensitive. Yeah. So I heard that first octave, and then you very very briefly hit the um the the yep. um second one below that. Yep. But yeah, it so, takes a lot of practice. Like so that. once you once you start getting closer to being comfortable with it, like if the, this is also a personal question, but I'm sure that once people try this, oh, uh, once people try this, they're going to need to ask ask this question as well. Um, 
Uh, what do you do? You start pushing more air once you know how that feels, or is, does it? Is it always quiet? That's that's a good question. So let me let me test it right here. I believe I know the answer, but uh, no, you don't change the air. The wow. air is the same. So yeah. yeah, so you're always kind of it's like it's kind of like if you go with the hose analogy. If you're using a fire hose, you don't want to stick your finger into that. It's not like exactly. that. That's your not going to do gonna anything. So you want to guard. That's a, that yeah. actually improves yeah. my analogy. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to write you, down the fire hose. There. Yeah, you have a garden hose. You, the, the hose has to be gentle for you to safely stick your finger into it and have it do anything. Exactly. Um, so my next question then is, obviously, you, you have, you, you're you like mastering this technique. Uh what are you doing with your mouth shape and your vowel shape to make sure that that sound is really cleaned up? So uh, when I was talking before about like you want to kind of have it closed, like I usually start, you could even try it in a second here, like on an E or an A. So like, I don't know why it's easier on a closed vowel. It's but, like, um, it's like that with, it, it's like that with, with false folds too. It's easier on closed vowels. There you go. Yeah. Parallels. Perfect. Yeah. So when once you start getting familiar with it, I recommend finding like the perfect note that you sound the best on with subharmonics and keep practicing with that note. Once you do that, then you could like go up a half step and then go down a half step and just broaden your range for it. Because I, I have a wide range of like subharmonics. I could even go like high with subharmonics. Yeah. But um when uh that then you can like kind of build that range for subharmonics. Once you do that, you can start um, you can start like changing your vowels and experimenting with vowels. So like if I start on E or an A. <clears throat> and then you can just transition to different vowel shapes and then because sometimes when you do different vowel shapes, it, it can affect how you're singing mentally. Yeah. And um, so when you go like it might like you might hear a pop when trying to change to a vowel shape like, yeah, like if I try and go to an yeah. ah sometimes and it can pop, you just got to you got to kind of work and memorize again, muscle memory, those um, your vocal folds adjusting as weird as it sounds, adjusting to the vowels. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I would imagine, and this is, I think this is another parallel, uh, another commonality between the false chord method and the true vocal chord method is hmm. uh, because you're not pushing very much air, I would imagine that you're very limited on how you can uh, enunciate. I know we just talked about how important it is to enunciate words. But if you're not pushing very much air, you're not going to be able to like do these clear S and P sounds because those are very dependent on yep. um, those are very dependent on uh, pushing air. Uh, so I would imagine that it's hard to form full words doing mm. a, a true vocal uh, sub, and it's easier to just yeah. hit hit a vowel sound. It's definitely yeah, it's definitely a hundred percent much harder to. Um, like when you're first practicing it again sometimes you're like able to hit a note solid but if you try and talk into it like talk in subharmonics you'll find it like popping in and out because of stuff like that like sometimes with like a p or an s yeah uh not vowel s is not a vowel for those of you listening <laughs> um those consonants you just um it just takes again more practice adjusting to it like like I can sometimes just like talk in subharmonics and I can keep going like this because I've been doing it for a while and I can kind of sound like a robot or right. whatever. But it sounds soft. Well, it sounds exactly. It, yeah. All, all of those words are like sound soft spoken. So you can barely hear, you can like barely hear, like even my S is like, hello, I'm doing subharmonics. Yeah. Like, I'm, like, yeah. like I'm doing S's in kind of a different way. And, and it sounds like you're even kind of like, turning off the subharmonic for a second so that you can get that s sound in and then immediately flipping it back on almost like it probably it, it, yeah. it, it, like well m maybe that's a bad way of explaining it but it's like you're you're uh 
like you kind of have to No, yeah because you stop you stop filmating yeah. it yeah when you uh, do like it's, otherwise it'll be a z so yep you, yeah yeah so you're literally uh, so you're yeah, literally like yeah so you're literally shutting it off for a second and then turning it back on which is uh, like yeah i it, that's crazy that you have that amount of control with that range with that with that now that i know five years yeah now that i know <laughs> how little air you have to push uh in order to do that properly that's insane that you're able to have that much control because for 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 anyone who isn't familiar with this it's actually easier to sing loud than it is to sing quietly because yeah. when when you're projecting a lot of air it's it's very easy to confidently hit all those pitches but when you're when you're singing quietly it's it's you it actually takes a lot of control to be able to 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 control your pitch with such a such a small amount of air is being pushed through your vocal cords um, that singing at a low volume means that you have to have that much more accuracy with putting your vocal cords in exactly the right place. So what what suffice to say, what Bobby is doing here is some next level stuff. It's very very impressive. So. B bringing bringing um if if some of you guys have seen um actually maybe i'll be able to pull this up because um uh on my patreon i post some um some videos of my tiktoks but it's like my isolated vocals one yeah. of the songs i did was uh wellerman go figure with ear candy <laughs> and um and that was that was one of the um a very hard subharmonic note uh the subharmonic moment to hit because I'll show you in a second. Essentially, while you're I'm flipping back and forth, while yeah. you're pulling that up, I'm gonna run to the bathroom really quick. Sounds good. Uh, so let me find it, and I will show you guys, and I'll show Jonathan when he gets back. Um, so uh, where is it? Uh, da, 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 nope, nope, nope. There it is. So um, yep, here it is. Blank, blank. This is what it'll sound like. Oh, blow my bully boys blow. Soon may the weller man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue is done, we'll take our leave and go. So I don't know if I can even do it properly right now because it's very, very hard. Um, I start like, soon may the weller man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue is done, we'll take our leave and go. Okay, that went better than I thought it was going to. But um, again, if you have a hard time like hearing which one's the subharmonic, I'll go like that when I'm in subharmonics. And soon may the well men come to bring out sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue is done, we'll take our leave and go. So... After you're practicing for a while, you want to be able to make that transition between um, between subharmonic and chest come very very smoothly. So one of the um, one of the things I recommend is like doing scales down. Like uh, let's choose like G. Do 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 do. do. Nope, that's not in G major. Do do. You, practicing scales and transitioning helps. Uh, now that Jonathan's back, I'll show him the video. Yes. So essentially, in the video, I'm switching back and forth in between subharmonics and chest voice, just because of how my voice was feeling that day. Yeah. And it allowed me to hit notes uh, easier. So this is just my isolated vocals for it. Uh, it's coming up. Oh, blow my bully boys blow. Soon may the weller man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue is done, we'll take our leave and go. Wow. So so that that was very I was surprised I could do it that morning. I, I'll try and do yeah. it again. But um I'll flip up my finger. Can you see me by the way? Yes. So I'll flip up my finger when I'm in subharmonics. So yeah. essentially I was like I can hear it soon. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Soon may the weller men come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue is done, we'll take our leave and go. Yep. And so wow. some of the practice techniques that I'll explain in a second help help transitioning that. Because in my mind, 
even though I'm technically going, soon may the willowmen come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. Yep. Because I'm technically going up, but in my mind, I trick myself to think that I'm going lower. Yeah. But yeah. Wow. <sighs> uh, but to ask me that like three years ago, no way I could have done yeah, that. Yeah, that is insane. Uh, well, do you want to tell us your practice techniques for this, and then I'll uh, I'll I'll get into the uh, the danger zone with some false chord yes. stuff. Hell yes! I'll actually read some of the rest of this um, document that I had. Um, and so for you guys, uh, um, uh, the next point. Where am I? Here we go. Okay. Uh, now, when you go into subharmonics, um, it should sound like a flip or a voice crack when you go in and out because that's that's what it's doing. It's like imagine your voice going into falsetto and cracking into chest. Like, ah, I can't really do a crack. Ah, I can't really do a crack yep. right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know what a vo vocal crack sounds like. You, you a could, voice crack you could, sounds like. You could hear my voice cracking when I tried to do it, <laughs> or the, that yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So it so it's a voice cracks just flipping in between like one register and another like sometimes accidentally um, like sometimes when I'm trying to do like a subharmonic and I'm like doo -doo 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 -da. oops it accidentally popped up that's embarrassing um, so it's it's essentially just a, a voice crack um, so if you're not sure oh another thing if you're not sure if you're doing vocal fry or subharmonics a good way to tell is to go in um so hit that low note if you're not sure what it is slide up and if you're in if you're in vocal fry uh it will just smoothly smoothly go up into your chest voice if you're in subharmonics you'll hear the octave flip yep. so hear how there is an octave flip right there some well if you're really good you can sometimes you can just bring that subharmonic all the way up but that's yeah. like an easy way to tell if you're a beginner and you can't tell if you're in vocal fry or subharmonics and it takes a lot of experimenting to find that right feeling like we said as it took me months to even be able to do now um practicing stuff let's see uh i have some in my head but i just want to follow this um so one of my disclaimers that I run in here, I wouldn't practice for more than like a half an hour on like your first several days doing this, because if you're doing it wrong, you could hurt yourself. Yes. By the way, if you're singing something and it starts to hurt, it's stop. probably because it's bad. Yeah, exactly. Just stop. And um, vocal frying. Oh, sorry. Had to crack my back there. Um, vocal cry crying. Vocal crying. <laughs> That's me. Yeah. All the time, vocal um, frying. <laughs> vocal frying can hurt your voice, even though it's even though it sounds very soft and it uh, it doesn't seem like something that could damage your voice. Uh, still, be careful with all this and make sure that you're doing your due dil diligence. Yeah, like you don't want to be talking in like vocal fry all day. Like, yeah, what's up, Becky? Yeah, I was like doing this or whatever. No, you just the, normally talk in your chest voice because that's that's the healthiest thing you can do yes um and uh since uh what else do i have since it's also a different placement than normal singing uh you don't want to do this technique to the point where you're literally doing it all the time or just talking in it like 24 7 because then you're going to start forming bad habits of always being in that placement remember this type of singing is not like you're singing a whole song like it. It's for like the money notes that you want to hit, like a low note at the end of the song, or if you can't reach a certain low note for the day. Um, so definitely, you don't want to be singing entire songs in it. Like even, like the phrase I sung at the end of that, like, dig, dig, are leaving go. Like that's fine because it's brief, but if I sung a whole verse like that, probably sound weird, but and like. You're and yeah. you're in the studio in a controlled environment doing that a couple times and then resting your voice. If you were on tour, yes. If you were on tour, it might be very bad for you to try and do that every single night and then sing another hour afterwards. A hundred percent. Like, um, I have you heard of this? Um, there's this acapella group called Voice Play, and the um, yep. bass in it is Jeff Castellucci. and um, he he is very good at this subharmonic technique. He actually learned it from um the same videos I learned it from. He learned it like several years ago and now he's, um, he's practiced it a lot. He's able to do it live. Yeah. Now, 
in the studio, like when I'm recording here, like doing a TikTok or whatever, I can like if if I don't get it like right on the first time, I could be like, okay, just wait for the part thing to come up. Go. Okay, that sounds good. I'll just like cut it in there a little bit because it just easier than doing it and you want to save time and stuff yep. like that but um doing it live is a whole different demon it is in it is especially if you're a beginner it's incredibly hard yeah. to do subharmonics live and props to jeff costalucci for not being afraid of that like literally this this guy's like hitting like, like that note yeah. live like every night in an oogie boogie man and it's yeah it's impressive and the way that he's able to hit it is, as you can tell, it's a very delicate technique because you can easily pop in and out of it. Yeah. Um, so, like, if you can't hear yourself properly, properly, like you don't have in-ear monitors or you don't have monitors at all or, like, all the other parts are louder than yours, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to actually be able to sustain that note without holding on to it or without hearing it. So that's yes. that's another point yes um and da, 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 if you find yourself using a lot of oh yeah and then i noted this uh, if you find yourself using a lot of air and you're still producing the subharm like a subharmonic the octave lower that's um that's going to be the technique that uh jonathan and i are going to go into in a little bit which is uh false fold subharmonics um uh yes uh, actually i'm seeing some of the chat right now tommy p drink a lot of water Seriously, like literally, my my last name's Water. I love water so much. Yes, um, because it lubricates your vocal folds, and it's also just good to drink a lot of water. The fastest now, way um, to permanently damage your voice. The fastest way to permanently damage your voice is to sing when you are not properly hydrated. Like, there you go. It's like this, this guy's. This guy's yeah. been singing for years live and doing covers and stuff listen to him well i went to a throat doctor like i i drink like four or five of these a day like Ooh, nice yeah like I, I i drink like i just i just threw one if it's if you know uh, my editor probably doesn't want to go back and find it but i had one that was almost empty and i i threw it and i grabbed this one uh and it's only it's only three o'clock p.m here uh so that was that was the first one that I found. And also, I drink like milk and and tea. I've got it. I've got a ton of hydration stuff right tea. in front of me. Yeah. So, um, you know, this has a ton of ice cubes in it. So even though it does have other stuff, it is at least fifty percent water, or way more than that. It's like ninety percent water. Um, but uh, but the other thing is, like, I went to a throat doctor recently because my voice just felt a little tired and I just wanted to be safe. And like, he was just like, yeah, just like drink more water. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. And like, I have like a humidifier now and I have like a nebulizer that like you like breathe in. Cause I live in California where it's very dry. Um, so I have a humidifier that's literally like six inches away from my head when I sleep and just blowing moist air on me. And then I have like a, a little, a thing that looks like an inhaler where I literally just breathe in moist air for like a couple I've minutes. I've seen those. Yeah. And I've wanted to get one of those. What, what's the one that um, you get? Because I hear it's really good. So for I use Vocal Mist is the brand and Lauren Babick, who's one of the most prolific and proficient screamers that I know specifically recommended that I get that. So, uh, what's your last name again? Lor Lauren Babic, B A B I C. Uh, She's a screamer oh, yep. that I've worked with a lot, Perfect. and I, when I was having some vocal troubles, she was like, "Yeah, you should get one of these vocal mist things." Yeah. So, like, if you know, if you're serious about being a singer, like, cut smoking, cut energy drinks, cut, uh, you know, stuff that is that has a lot of caffeine cut uh soda um like if you're serious and you really want to be a good singer all of those things are going to dry your throat out really badly like if you eat a ton of burgers mm. in one sitting if you eat a ton of red meat in one sitting all that acid in that red meat is going to bubble up into your throat and literally burn your vocal cords and you're going to get acid reflux like me and then you're going to have to 
deal with that as a singer and that's going to make it harder to keep your voice hydrated. So all of the all of the things that you do that dry out your throat like caffeine, sugary foods, red meat, uh I know some singers that had to go vegan just because they were losing their ability to sing because they had way too many sugary foods, they had way, like I, I mm. love eating meat. I love eating meat. Like I you know my wife cooks a lot, you know, we, we have a lot of meat in our house, like, I'm not vegan by any means, but if I have too big of a burger, I won't be able to sing as well the next day, because that, all the acid will, you know, uh, it'll, anytime you're like burping and a little bit, you can kind of like taste the stomach acid in your mouth if it's a big enough burp. Oh, yeah. yeah. Any t- if that's ever happening to you, that's because literal acid literal stomach acid is coming up and burning your vocal cords as it comes up and then you taste it so think I about was that actually, stuff um i was watching an interview with um we talked to we, we talked about him a while ago but david draymond he um yep. he, he's a vocalist that he struggled with acid reflux like severely i forget what album it was during but he had it just where it was constantly going over his vocal cords and obviously like your vocal cords are sensitive in a way especially to acid like most things are so like a hundred percent i didn't even know that about red meat so that is good to know thank you yeah but um yeah each person has to deal with it a a different way and you don't want to go to the point where like you have to get like surgery or something to like yep. like recover and especially it's because that's the worst case scenario l- like bobby said earlier especially if you have a higher voice if you're a uh if you're a female you ha- you have a higher soprano voice you're you know any 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 gender discussion aside you, genetically your vocal cords are more delicate and that means that you have to, to be much more careful with the vocal techniques and the hydration that you're doing. Um, yes. So, um, yeah. yeah. Do we uh, want to get yeah. into false chords here? Oh, I was going to go. I just remembered before we yeah. were going to. I'm go just going to label a couple practice tips. Yes. That um, uh, So, like, some beginning practice tips um, uh, is just basic control. So, like, literally take your finger and just... Uh, imagine like you're flipping like you're almost flipping a light switch just switching registers like uh, you want to be able to like do that on command and once you master that you can keep going crazy with it and other things like what I was talking about especially with the ear candy Wellerman stuff when I'm like switching between sub harmonics and chest voice um uh, one of the good things that uh, to practice, um, I think I was actually doing it uh, as Jonathan came back, was um, go like singing scales down and transitioning into subharmonics like halfway through, like la 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 la, and then you'll obviously be able to think of it even though you're singing higher for the subharmonic. Because I'm technically singing, la 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 la. Um, the subharmonic makes it. You want to think you're going lower as well. Uh, and sometimes what helps is easing up even more, like just like even backing off a little bit, especially on the air when you're singing and going to subharmonics, because you really need light air. And one of the last practice tips I have is um, is um like what I was doing, just practicing it in songs like, um, like Jeff Costalucci is, um, a good example of this. Like if you want to like practice certain notes, uh, find, um, what was it like white Christmas or Arabian nights that he does like another Arabian nights to a part where you can switch to that, uh, sub harmonic. And, um, also vocal slides when you're doing it, like he did in white Christmas, uh, it was like, May all your Christmases be white. So, like, kind of like switching while you're singing has to be like really, um, 
you have to be really particular about it so it doesn't like flip back the octave where you're like b wah, wah. Yeah. just get to like once you get to the point where you're like, b white you can even um kind of hide it in that um when i was changing like vowels like b once i go about to go wah, yeah the then w. i just kind of lighten up and switch it yeah exactly um, but yeah, those are some practice tips. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think we're ready. All right. Transition. Actually, I'm going to hit the bathroom first. Yes. I apologize. Go for it. <laughs> I hope you're all doing well in the chat. Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to answer a couple questions if you guys have any. Uh, I'll try to pull up Bobby Bass's chat here as well. Um, if you guys have any other things that you, you specific questions about this that you want to ask about uh, while Bobby's taking a bathroom break, and then we'll get started on false chords as soon as he's back. Yeah, acid reflux is definitely not pleasant. Get in the bin. Bobby Bass bathroom break. <laughs> Oh boy. Uh, I'm already doing, uh, Tommy, I'm already doing uh, false chord subharmonics in covers, and um, it, it technically is still a subharmonic, but it's achieved in a different way. Uh, I have an original song coming out um, that uh, the last note in the song is a false chord sub. I'm definitely going to practice the true, the true sub, though. Is doing subharmonics limited to the bass vocal range? No, it is not. Bobby said earlier, uh, women can do it as well. Um, I'm going to be explaining what false chords are in just a minute. Dr. School. How many hours a day are you actually working with your voice? I like to work with my voice about two hours a day. Uh, max. Usually I, I'll sing for an hour and then I'll be done singing for the whole day. Um, but that's if I'm pushing myself really hard. If I'm, if I'm doing a lot of grit, I will never sing for more than an hour a day if I... Uh, if I'm smart. Um, unfortunately, when I have business meetings and phone calls and streams and stuff, I end up talking a lot more than I probably should be. A lot of, a lot of the practice techniques that Bobby was mentioning are also applicable uh, to, uh, to false chord. Hey, thank you so much for the raid. Shield wall. We're being raided. Thank you for the raid, Ooh. Blaze. Welcome, raiders. All right. Someone actually asked um, asked a question to you on my chat. Also, um, it was funny when I was in the bathroom. I looked at um, my YouTube page, and um, if if you sing subharmonics and post about it, take note of this. Someone literally commented fake on the Wellerman one I just showed you right now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yep. so if you ever get comments like that or something, or any hateful comment in general, do not be discouraged. They're jealous. Yeah. They're just jealous. It's okay. Use it to fuel you to do better and stuff like that. It's, yes. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it takes you getting used to. But um, uh, the question that was, uh, to, uh, let me see. Uh, someone said, so, oh my God, they can't remember. Uh, so are your songs on Spotify that have subharmonics, false chord harmonics, Jonathan? I do have Jonathan. one song. I do have one song. I think one or two songs on Spotify where I use the false chord subharmonic, but I'm actually going to show you guys uh, as part of my little explanation here. I have an original song that I'm about to release where I hit a pretty nasty uh, false chord sub at the very end of the song and I might look into seeing if it breaks some kind of a record uh, if we get the song on rock radio 
it might actually be like the lowest note ever sung on mainstream oh, rock radio. Oh, that would be sick. So I might look into that. But um, anyway, so I'm going to start this by explaining my false chord grit technique. And then I'm going to explain how I accidentally discovered how connected that is to false chord subs. And then I'm going to explain the false chord subs. Uh, so I'm going to put a marker down here. And then I'm going to start my explanation here. So this is one of the questions that I get the most. One of the comments that people always have for me uh, more than any other comment when singers ask me something, they're always asking, how do you sing with grit? How do you sing with um, the edgy, um, the, the, the roar, the, the metal screaming? Uh, people are constantly asking me how to sing aggressively like a metal singer. And again, it is not only incredibly difficult and incredibly technical, but it is dangerous for your voice. And if you are not incredibly careful, and if you are not also incredibly experienced before you do this, you will do it wrong and you will permanently damage your voice. The other thing that I want to say before I explain this is that I am not a vocal coach. I am not a, uh, I'm not a voice teacher. I'm not a vocal coach. Uh, I'm not a throat doctor. So don't try this at home, I guess. Uh, my explanation of this is, um, is not going to be exhaustive. And uh, much of what I'm doing with these things are what you would call a studio safe technique, but you should not be doing these techniques for five hours a day or going on tour and doing them every single day. Like I'll do these false chord techniques to add grit to my voice and then I'll rest my voice for a full day. So this is not something that you want to just hop in, go in, into the bathroom mirror and try singing like Jonathan Young. You're going to mess something up if you do that. With that being <laughs> said, if you are curious and you promise not to try this at home, or if you are an experienced singer, which is why I'm very glad that we have Bobby in this call, um, if you're an experienced singer and you understand the vocabulary, you understand how to use your voice to do these things, uh, then if you're safe about it, if you're doing your due dil diligence, you can try this. But be very careful because as people are bringing up in the chat right now, there are professional singers who mess this up and permanently destroy mm -hmm. their voice. The singer of Avenged Sevenfold needed to get surgery yes. because he, he, he pushed his voice too hard going on tour and he got blisters called vocal nodes on his, on his throat from pushing his throat too hard and that almost ruined his career. The singer from Bring Me the Horizon, Ollie Sykes, had to completely change the way that he was singing because for half of his career, he was singing with bad vocal technique. So... Just because you see somebody on the internet singing or screaming in a certain way does not necessarily mean that it's safe to do it because even the professionals are, are messing this up. So I might even be doing this wrong, but I'm doing all of it in a very controlled, safe environment, and I, I know my own limits, so I'm resting my voice every time that I, that I push too hard. With that said... I'm going to try and explain how I add grit to, to my vocals. So Someone just uh, commented, sounds like a commercial for medicine. Take this to save your life. Side, mix, side <laughs> effects may include life-threatening stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, I didn't know some of this until recently, and I've been doing some homework, and that's part of why I didn't want to talk about this at all in the past. Um but I've been learning more about how some of this stuff works. And like we said earlier in this discussion, there's a, there are muscles above your vocal cords called your false cords. 
and you can constrict them the same way that you constrict your normal vocal cords to create pitches. And if you do that, if you constrict your false cords in a certain way, they vibrate and that creates grit. So the way that you can try this, even if you're not a singer, is you can kind of do like a, a growl. <sighs> Right? So when you do that kind of ha, 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 and if you've ever like gotten into a really loud argument with no, hey, hey, you, that's your false chords is your, your, that, that, ha, 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 that grit is coming from the muscles above your vocal cords called your false chords constricting. And that's why if you shout at someone for even a couple minutes, your voice is going to feel really tired. If you go to a rock concert and you, oh yeah, like if you're screaming the lyrics like that, uh, your voice is going to be tired because you are constricting your false chords in order to push that much volume and air out of your voice. So it's very important that you are very, very careful and safe about this. But the way that this works kind of similar to what Bobby is doing with his uh, true chord subharmonic technique is you can sing any pitch like ha ah, and then you can blend in this ah, ah, ah. so I'm going to try and demonstrate this ha ah, ah. you hear that how as I'm pushing, as I'm constricting my, ah, I, it looks like I'm moving my mouth, but that's not the important thing. You can keep your mouth, ah, right? So you're blending in this false chord tension. And if you're not very careful with that, you're going to hurt your voice real fast. But once you get good at it, uh, once you know how, um, once you know how to blend it properly, and once you know how to turn it on and off like that, you can uh, you can just flip into it. You can just la 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 la. Right? Like you can just like turn it on and off. Uh, and that's the best way that I can describe it. Again, don't try this at home unless you're a really experienced singer. But you literally just. Uh, you just kind of blend in a certain, and, and it doesn't have to, you don't have to go all the way. Uh, there's kind of like a, a spectrum of, uh, and with different vowel shapes, you can kind of like, um, you can shape it differently. Like, like A is a really fun one. Like you can kind of create this really fun texture with your false chords. Ooh, ah, e, e, right? So you can do all these different flips. Uh, so that's how I apply grit. And it's using your false chords, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and you have to be very careful with this. So, uh, how you do subs with this is something that I discovered by accident. Because I was actually watching some of uh, the TikToks that some of the, the people in this, in the bass subharmonic community of, of TikTok were posting. And I, I, somebody explained how to do it. And I actually misunderstood. Uh, I think it might have been Johnny. Uh, I think I might have seen one of Johnny's TikToks explaining Probably, how to do yeah. subs, and um, and I mi oh, yeah, that'd I, be Johnny. I I misunderstood how to do it and accidentally did false chords instead of the half frying that uh, that you described, and it came very naturally to me because the way to do false chord uh, false chord subharmonics is actually almost exactly the same as doing that grit up ah yeah 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 it's almost exactly the same thing uh so all you do 
you sing a lower note, and basically the the vibration of your false chords, when you do it lower, is going to create that subharmonic vibration that we're talking about. So, um, yeah, this is so th this technique for me is easier than uh, than the true vocal fold technique, but that's because I have five years of true vocal cord uh, workouts that I've been doing. I've been flexing my, or false cord, excuse me. I've been flexing my false vocal cord muscles for like five years and getting very comfortable with that. So it's very easy for me to figure out how to do these false cord subs because it's the same as singing uh, gritty metal stuff for me, but it's harder for me to, f to figure out how to do Bobby's version because I've never used those muscles. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, Bobby, I think the false chord way of doing this is actually a, a bigger danger to your voice because... 100%. Yeah. So... Like, um, um, I can do it, but it it sometimes, if, sometimes it hurts, which is, again, yep. what we said earlier, if it hurts, stop doing it. Yep. Um, but yeah, so I could only do it for sometimes. I've been getting better at it now, but like still after like a couple tries with doing it, it will just like get scratchy and stuff. Yeah. So the way that I discovered this is um, through all of the, the gritty singing that I had done, you know, uh, I had kind of discovered this weird Mongolian throat singing like, like kind of a Mongolian throat singing thing that I had kind of accidentally discovered how to do because it, it's exactly the same kind of false chord pressure that uh, that exists in that kind of Mongolian throat singing. And then I realized that I could take that same grit and just move it down into my range and do the exact same thing. You sing a pitch... Uh, that is not super low in your range. It's the same concept like Bobby said earlier. You don't want to sing the lowest note that you can sing. You want to sing like a fifth or an octave above that. And then... Uh, you literally just... You literally just push in this... Uh, you, you literally just tighten your false chords. And if you know how to do that, if you know how to ha ah, ah, then you can literally just ah, 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 Yeah, so like like Bobby did before with his technique, you can literally hear it click. Um he So. And fun fact, uh, kind of like, well, exactly like my technique too. With that technique, you can go further down the subharmonic series with it. I have not figured out how G to do that yet. Exactly but. like that. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's like like mine. It's very hard, but in that case, it's even more dangerous. Yeah, because um, I would crowd, imagine I would yeah. imagine that you would need even more tightness. Yes, in order to create. A, an even faster vibration in your false chord muscles that are not meant to be vibrating at all like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're really putting yourself at risk um, for vocal damage if you do that. Um, and like uh, similar to Bobby's subharmonic technique, it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to uh, to enunciate words. Um, it's hard to to say any words down here because you kind of have to stop and start, uh, right? Like you, like anytime you do an S, anytime you do a P, you actually have to like cut in and out of um, of doing that technique, um, and uh, certain vowels are easier than others. Um, certain amounts of air are easier than others. Uh, it, you definitely have to push more air than you do with the true vocal fold sub technique. It definitely requires a lot 100%, more. 100%, yes. Um, it definitely requires a lot more pressure, uh, a lot more 
focused air control, um, which to me makes it easier because you can just push more air and it's actually kind of harder to use less air. Um, but if you, you know, um, if I push too much air, you start to hear I'm losing the pitch. Like you, it, you literally just lose it. So you have to find this sweet spot where you're, you, you're, pu- you're focusing the air just because when you push more air, you're actually causing those false vocal folds to vibrate faster. Um, so, uh, yeah. Hey, Johnny's actually in the chat. Uh, so I, I do have to thank Johnny for accidentally kind of turning me on to trying to do this because <laughs> I think I saw Johnny's TikTok trying to explain the true fold uh, sub technique, and I accidentally discovered this because I'm a metal singer and I do all this false <clears throat> chord stuff. Um, uh, so it, it's also funny because um, he was saying uh, he might have said this in your chat as well, but um, uh, there's this guy that we know called. Uh, uh, I never know how to pronounce his last name. It's Alex Miang's, Alex Miang, I think. And he, um, he's, uh, a lot of the stuff he does is in choir. And yeah. he's not like a true bass too, but um, he uses a technique that, uh, that some refer to as like VVM, which is, I think, like uh, ventricular something modulation, vi- ventricular vibe, oh, something like that. But it, it's very, it's essentially um, the throat technique that you're doing with like slightly dis- different placement. Yeah. And the placement makes it sound like like an octavist, like an extremely low, like a extremely low basso profundo in yeah. a choir. And so um, that's just something cool. Yeah. I've, and he's I've, really good at it. I've I'll send you e- videos on it. Because, yeah, yeah. I'd love to see it. I've been experimenting a lot with vowel shape and. Um, and placement and stuff with the technique and I've been pushing lower and lower the the better I get at it I think I hit a I think I ha- hit like a C like the whatever the lowest C on the piano is Oh a C1 uh, I think I hit a yeah, C1, C1 recently let me I'm probably not going to be able to do it but um here let me try hmm, so that's a low G That's an F. Yeah, so it gets harder, and it's it's hard to explain. The deeper you try to go with it, uh, the 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 breath is different. You have to have exactly the right amount of air moving through your false folds in order to vibrate at the right frequency. So, like, it almost feels like you have to kind of use less air. Like, it's less possible to be loud the deeper you get with this tech technique. Um, and and you, you kind of have to push. You have, you have to be more delicate the lower you get. Yeah, you can hear I'm starting to lose it. Um, yeah, I ha- I hit a C zero once. I I don't think that's happening right now, but um, so yeah, the the D zero is uh, I think usually what I'm hitting with that. Um, or I guess it's a D one because it re it resets yeah, D1. at C. Yeah. Um, it's no, that's crazy because literally, um, I only have like two notes with that technique. I can't go like yeah. higher or lower with it, obviously because I, yeah, you're you're a master at this. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So I I I'm I'm still learning, but I I'm definitely like getting better, um, because like you can you can even hear it if I start at a higher note, it just sounds like gritty metal singing. <laughs> And if I shit, yeah, like that's literally just a, and part of how I realized that this works like this is because pitch correction, if, if you scan the pitch in something like Melodyne, yeah. if I sing like a, yeah, like a Metallica, like, yeah, it will actually think that I'm singing an octave lower than I actually am. If you yeah. actually scan that pitch, 
that's part of how I like realized this. Uh, but yeah, so you can kind of like go. You can kind of go down the scale. So that's a C above the. Um, so I can hit that same C. And that's another weird thing about this technique is that uh, that's that C that I'm hitting there. Um, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Another thing that I that I glazed over here is that similar to um, similar to the true vocal fold technique, you have to sing. You have to you have to phonate the note that is an octave above the note that you're trying to hit. So, so I'm I'm singing this C, uh, and then as I apply the 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 false fold pressure, uh, it drops the octave. And the interesting thing about this is that if you go too high, and you're doing this on this higher C, I can usually hit that low C in in chest voice, and it'll sound deeper. Because the timber of the throat singing C1 uh, is so different, you know? So, right? So that's like the regular, that I'm, that's true vocal co chord uh, singing that C. But then if I sing that same C by phonating the octave above and false chord subbing it. It, it sounds like a higher note because those higher frequencies are still there because I'm phonating it. So it's a really odd, it's a really odd technique. No. But um, yeah, and it's same thing with uh, true fold subharmonics. Yeah, chest always sounds lower, usually. Yeah. So it's 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 a it's super fun, and I'm getting a lot better at it. So I can really like. <laughs> You know, I can kind of like start move, like you know, I can start moving around a little bit, and um, I can play for you guys. My stream has already heard this um, before, but I have this original song that I'm working on uh, that I can show you guys uh, what what it sounds like to uh, to do this in a song. Um, and Bobby mentioned before that you shouldn't be doing these techniques every day, and it uh, that also applies here, or not every day, but like you, you shouldn't be doing this for the whole song. You don't want to be singing a whole song down here. Like you don't want to be doing that for an entire song. But if you have this one low note, uh, I think I did it in the. Uh, am I allowed to say that we, the cover that I did for you, or has that been announced uh, yet? You know, let's not say okay, it just okay. yet. Let's keep I, everyone in mystery. Yeah, I have I have a cover that I that I Bobby was gracious enough to invite me to be a part of where uh, right at the very end I I took a crack at doing a false chord uh sub. Uh so what I like like Bobby said, uh there will usually be like a money note where you'll just flip the octave and just like a sledgehammer at the bottom of the, uh, the 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 very end of the song, you'll just like, you know, just drop it. Yeah. Um, so I have this song that I can show you guys where I do this at the very end of the song, and I'm super excited about it. Um, I'll, I'll skip to the end here. Um, you should be able to hear this through the Discord call, Bobby. Um Can you hear yep. that? Okay, awesome. I'm gonna skip yeah. to the I'm gonna skip to the end here. So right at the end. And that that's a, that's tough to do is like mm, conquer because like Bobby said before, you have to go up the octave to hit that note. So I had to sing mm, conquer the wolf within and then turn on the you know the 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 subharmonic. Yeah. Conquer the woo. Or wait, no. That's actually a full octave drop. So I think I conquer the wolf with it. Yeah, that's what I did. So I hit I hit the note that I'm supposed to be hitting, but then I just flip it. <laughs> that's Con epic. Conquer the wolf with it. Yeah, it's hard it's hard yes. to do it. You know what I mean? It's hard to oh, do yeah. it even right now. 
Yeah. Also, um, the one that you did on uh, on our secret project. Yes. Also, it's funny because some of the people also involved in the project yeah. are like <laughs> in the chat, like, "Oh yeah, that yeah. thing." Hmm, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But but seriously, y'all aren't ready. But yeah. in um, the mix that uh, I got sent, especially during um, your part uh, in the middle of the song, the one you do at the end of that phrase. Ooh, it sounds so <laughs> nice. Yeah. It sounds so Thank nice. Thank you, man. Yeah, I have a couple other covers where I've been kind of like experimenting with it. I did... Um, uh, the cool thing about this technique is that you can use it as texture really well. Um, uh, you can... Uh, if my internet works at all... Um, I did a cover of uh, Valhalla Calling by my good friend... Miracle of Sound, uh, and I did a lot of, uh, where is it? Here it is. Yeah. So I'm just using it as a texture on the bottom of that mix and it, it turned out really cool. And that was like the first month that I was experimenting with that technique. And it's literally just like you literally just change your vowel shape and it creates yeah. this sick like atmospheric sounds better with reverb, but <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, it yeah. always does. It's also um, you should check out especially because you can do the um false fold subharmonics so well um like the overtone singing that i've been doing yeah that i did earlier um especially with reverb it comes out so much more and it's yeah it's essentially just like the mongolian chanting it's it's i just love it I yeah because it, it ends so up it's it ends up sounding like a whistle it ends up sounding like yeah. an, like an ambient whistle when you when you put exactly. reverb on that which is very cool yeah Reverb is magical. Yeah. Yes. Reverb and compression are oh, yeah. the, the two golden, the, the two silver bullets of uh, sounding good as a singer. It's not, it's not auto-tune. It's not pitch correction. It's not melodyne. It's compression and reverb. But by <sighs> the way, what, um, just as a small digression, what do you usually, um, like for your main vocals, soloist stuff, what usually do you set your compressor to? Like what, uh, what settings? <laughs> I have two compressors maxed out on my vocals. Oh, just like full ratio and a low threshold yeah. or something? I am I am an absolute ape with compression. <laughs> <laughs> I am like like I com I absolutely crush everything that I do <laughs> with compression. <laughs> I have I have the CLA 3A compressor from waves audio oh i've heard of that which i love that compressor uh compressor sean connery um oh yes the impression yeah um i love that compressor uh there's a lot of other ones that you can use logic has some built-in compressors that are actually really really good um but mm. what i like about the cla 3a uh and there is a logic compressor that is similar or a setting on the logic compressor that's similar the cla 3a is literally just two knobs it's uh, how, mu uh, how much are you reducing the peaks? Uh, so like how, how much are you actually crushing it? And then how, what's the input level? And that's it. That, that's the, oh. it's, it's literally just two knobs and I have them both up to 10. On, at, like right now, when you're hearing my voice, I'm pretty sure I have a CLA 3A on this talkback mic and it's at least dialed up to like eight. I think I might have turned it down because I was compressing so hard that every time I would drink water or type on a keyboard, it would be like super loud. Um, oh, mine's weak. I only have a ratio of four on mine. <laughs> and then after, so first I compress like maxed out and then I put the CLA vocal plugin uh, or sometimes the Howard Benson vocal plugin, uh, depending on what kind of mood I'm in. Uh, and then I'll slam the input level and the compression knob on the CLA vocals plugin up to max again. So I have two pretty hefty vocal compressors that are both constantly maxed. And then there's some tricks that you can do where you can 
put in an equalizer before the first compressor in the signal chain. So you can have it be like the first thing that happens is you boost up some sibilance and some high frequencies. And then when you slam the crap out of a compressor after that in the signal chain, it will, uh, it will crunch down on all of your S's and P's and T's and D's. All of your consonants will be crunched so they'll, they won't be overbearing after you EQ'd them to be overbearing. Uh, because it'll fill out all of the rest of the things that you did not boost in the EQ by compressing them. But then on those moments, on those milliseconds where you have, um, where you have an S or a P or a T sound that needs to be clear, it will be super sharp and forward, uh, because of that signal chain. Um, I am totally stealing that. that yeah, go for it. Yeah. I, st I stole that trick from a producer that I am working with, and uh, I think I I probably need to let him just talk about that sometime because it's a it's an amazing <laughs> it's an amazing trick. And it, well, I suppose I can just talk about well, it's in his plugin. Uh, in, in the Howard Benson vocal plugin, there's a switch that allows you to move the equalizer so that it hits before the compressor. And that's why he that's why he put that into his mm. into his vocal plugin is because of that trick of uh, because if you if you EQ after the compressor, then all of that sibilance that you're boosting in the mix will be really overbearing and 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 cut into your 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 ears as you're listening. Um, but if you if you crunch that all down and slam it all down with the compressor, then it's not overbearing anymore and that can make such a huge difference, especially if you have a vocalist that isn't pronouncing their words very clearly and they're kind of blurring their words together. If you aren't somehow bringing out the clarity and the sibilance in the mix somehow in a way that isn't intrusive, people aren't going to be able to hear what, what words they're saying. They're not going to be able to tell what the words are. Uh, but if you just turn up the vocals, then all of the deep resonant frequencies in your voice are going to be overbearing because uh, because you're, you're turning everything up. So at some point, you need to boost just the sibilance, but you have to do that in a way where you're not um, absolutely slicing into people's eardrums with high-pitched frequencies. So besides the high boosts before the compressor, um, do you usually EQ after? Uh, I barely EQ at all, to be honest with you. I all right. like to be completely honest with you. I'll, I'll sometimes do the high boost. Uh, the CLA vocal plugin that I use a lot has a very simple uh, like resonance boost and then treble boost built into it. So that's technically an EQ, but beyond having a single knob that boosts presence frequencies and a single knob that boosts resonance frequencies, I barely ever EQ my vocals because all right. com when you're slamming the crap out of the compressor that much, all of the weird imperfections in, in the voice that you would normally want to surgically EQ kind of all get baked. Yeah, they they all kind of all of the problem frequencies when you're compressing that much all kind of get baked into this nice cake. And if there's a moment where the voice is really um, like, for example, if there's a resonant frequency that causes the vocalist to suddenly seem very loud for one second when they're singing a certain vowel shape, the compressor will actually like just fix that on its own just by virtue of it being on so loud. Um, Damn. and I've had vocalists, I'm working with a new client this week. I've worked with a bunch of other clients in the past where, um, if, if you just use some of those tricks, I'll have these clients that'll be like, I don't know what the heck you did to my vocals, but it sounds amazing. And I'm not doing anything except compressing the crap out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. Yep. Fixed. Yeah. Sound good knob go burr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's crazy i love it yeah damn i didn't know about that i need i have so many things to test out after this dude wow. if you ever have music production questions or anything hit me up 
I of course that's how I learned we I mean we mentioned that uh, when we talked very briefly last night but learning uh, tricks from your how friends do we, how do we even get to compressors uh we said that Mongolian throat singing sounds a lot better if you're compressing it and, and verbing it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering how far we yeah. went down the rabbit hole with that. Yeah. No, but that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, oh, actually, um, Johnny's Johnny asking, has a question. yeah, does that frequency squashing only happen when you're really smashing the compressors? <clears throat> like, it still works if you're not compressing it as much. Um, and there is, I, I, I feel obligated to, I guess, mention that there's, there's kind of a lot of discourse in the audio production community uh, that's kind of turning into like a, a music production culture war about whether or not compressing a lot is is good or bad. There's kind of like a, a, a traditionalist, old school productions uh, school of thought, um, like a vintage school of thought that kind of is of the opinion that it's bad for people to just mindlessly slam compressors the way that I always do. Uh, and then, uh, but then all of these modern pop records that you listen to, like, you know, Billie Eilish and, and Post Malone and, and mm -hmm. all of these modern records that have that super forward, super intimate vocal sound where you can perfectly, it sounds like the vocalist is right up against your ear. Anytime that you hear that super modern production sound, that's compression. So if you want to, if you want to sound vintage, if you want to sound more like a Broadway musical, then by all, yeah, by all means, don't compress very much because you're not going to sound like a Broadway musical soundtrack if you're slamming the crap out of the compressors. But what I like to tell people is that like, uh, in, in, in answer to, uh, to Johnny's question, um, in my opinion, all types of singing are benefited by more compression because soft singing is going to sound thin unless you really compress it. If you, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like when I'm getting closer to the mic here, if I'm talking quietly here, uh, it sounds full and rich and it sounds like it's right in your ear. But if I'm talking at the same, if I'm talking at the same volume level back here, <clears throat> it sounds a lot thinner and you lose a lot of the resonance. And th this is kind of the same effect. Getting closer to the microphone has kind of the same effect as slamming a compressor. Um, and loud singing is greatly benefited from heavy compression because, uh, like it's it's hard to explain but not only will you push not only are you subduing the uh the variable nature of loud singing by compressing it cuz like it, if i'm singing up here and then i yeah if i like go up there for a second that one moment is going to be crazy loud unless you compress everything so it's all at a consistent level. Because then you can always go back in and automate the volume level to the needs of the song. You, so it's, in my opinion, yeah. it's better to, to slam the crap out of your compressors and then manually decide how loud the vocals need to be after that. Because compression isn't just about volume, it's also about fullness and depth. The compression is going to bring out all of these, um, all of these subtleties in the timber of your voice and the endings of words, the beginnings of, of words. If you like, uh, like if you like scoop up to a note, that scoop is going to be very quiet unless you slam the crap out of the compressor. Uh, if you fall off of, uh, you know, uh, uh, I like to use villain songs as an example. Um, I know that your powers of retention. You know, like all those little tension, all those little things. If you're not compressing it, it's going to kind of sound like, I know that your powers of retention. It just sounds goofy. It just sounds like, like cardboard thin. But then you compress it. And I know that your power, like all those little breaths, all those little, yeah, you know, all those little noises get 
um, they get really uh, elevated by the compressor. Um, and and that makes you think if you're if you're recording with a heavy compressor on, it makes you think about all of those little noises that you're making uh, with your mouth, and you'll find yourself becoming a more accurate singer because mm. any any tiny little noise that you make when the compressor is slamming that hard is going to be really full and really. Uh, it's going to have a lot of depth. So um, so I would highly advise that even if you don't decide to use a lot of compression in the final mix, having a ton of compression and, and understanding what that sounds like is going to make you closer to your own voice. It's going to make you more self-aware about how are you ending your notes? How are you breathing? How are you starting your notes? How are you scooping? How are you, uh, how are you connecting your words together? Um, and that is such a big part of, of what I do as a producer and as a writer and as a singer now, now that I know I've heard my own voice through these heavy compressors so often that I'm constantly aware of all of these little intimacies uh, that you hear. Um, so like when I, when I do like Disney covers for like any of the villain songs, uh, I'm really thinking about, you know, hellfire. Like what, what's, what's in between the words that I wouldn't be hearing unless I was slamming the compressor. So... That was a really long-winded answer, but I think it's, uh, I think it's really important. And I've worked with singers who come from the old school line of thinking. I've worked with a lot of singers who don't hear their voice with a lot of compression very often, and they're usually not very good at being conscious of the little intimate noises that their voices are making. You know, so yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that I now that you mention it, it makes so much more sense that was one of the things that i really liked about your voice whenever you well whenever you sing anything because you Thank can you. hear that in every single part of course yeah. in every single part every single like intention of every single phrase of every word of every consonant is intentional yeah and it's not like it's not like like you're just you it, it makes it so much more believable as well yeah yeah, it's it's uh, it's crazy, man. It's it's definitely be in that regard. Learning about producing and learning uh, about how stuff like compression works has helped me uh, a lot as a singer, um, because the traditional mainstream music industry record label way of doing things is to kind of just find somebody that hopefully is pretty good at all of these things by coincidence like like hopefully the singer in the band that your record label signs is self-aware of their own voice enough to think about those things because a lot of times uh, in a in a fancy music studio the singer is not going to be hearing all the crazy compression uh, when they're recording and it's not until the mix that that stuff gets brought out um but when you when, when you start thinking about this, you'll start to hear it in iconic songs. At, you, in Broadway musicals, you'll start to hear like I'm, it's exactly what you're describing, like like very deliberate and intentional delivery of the lyrics. And that's part of why Broadway singers are so damn good because a lot of times they're practicing just like just listening in, in a bathroom or whatever in a, like a dressing room and they, they're hearing all of those intimacies of their voice and they're singing it so much they, they learn those things. But in, in other places like Freddie Mercury is a, a amazing at doing little things like that. Little, little like uh intentional delivery of every single word uh uh gerard from my chemical romance uh does a lot of that kind of stuff where like there will be a very specific way mm. a very specific way that he'll end a word and and go into a next word uh he'll do you know uh, all these all these different things um uh like the the song that that howard benson produced um 
uh, I'm not okay, where he's like, I'm not okay. Like he's like, he's, he's really doing these unique vowel shapes and all these fascinating, like deliberate, um, things where he's like contorting the sounds that he's making in really wild ways. And if you're just singing about, if you're just thinking about, I'm not okay. If you're just thinking about hitting the pitches, you're not going to be doing any of that. And, uh, mm. many of these producers for that reason are more likely to sign a singer who is desperately out of tune, but good at delivery because you can fix, you can very easily fix uh, tuning with auto-tune and Melodyne, but you can't fix mm -hmm. delivery. There's no, no way to fix bad vocal delivery. So, yeah. Yeah, that is so true. And especially like, and they can be so apparent that like, you won't even notice that it's tuned. And um, with like Melodyne or something like that, because it's so transparent, but yeah. you still get all those like crisp, intentional things. Yeah. And again, that that um, that producer who did that, that, that was the yeah. guy you worked with. Right? Howard Benson. Yeah. I'm, oh, he damn. and he he mixed this Wolf Within song that I showed you guys. So, oh, yeah. Badass. Yeah. My, my girlfriend loves my chemical romance. She's going to freak out. Yeah. But um, no, that's awesome. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's fun, man. It's definitely uh it's a lot to think about. It's a lot of stuff to, to, to think about and be aware of. Um, but that's part of why, uh, I mean, I, I think I can speak for you when I say that's part of why we love it. You know, it's, uh, there's so many different things to excel at and so much to explore. Um, it's fun just diving into it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. It's uh, like, I'm, I just started diving into this stuff. Um, 2019 so i haven't been doing it too long well that's when i like started learning about it before right. i started actually doing stuff like this more recently but i'm um, like every time i hear stuff like this um it's just it's just makes me more excited about what i can do yeah with all these things because especially like doing recording stuff nowadays there's like you have so many tools and toys that you can use that you can become all you need is your creativity yeah and then you could just go what nuts on it. Yeah, that's the other thing, man, is that um, we are very lucky to be the first generation that is not limited by uh, by any gatekeepers on account of tools. Um, we are like, and th this is, we could talk for hours about this and I'm sure, you know, we've been, I know it's getting, uh, getting close to dinner time where you're at and I, sun is starting to set here. We should probably wrap it up pretty soon, but, um, it's a good, it's a good kind of idea to, to kind of leave people with is that, um, 20 years ago, if you wanted to be a successful musician, you had to convince somebody in a suit with a lot of money who probably was a, a huge piece of garbage. You had to convince that horrible person that you are worthy of success before you would become successful. Uh, and now you can skip that step like we did. We went straight to the listeners. Um, and even five year, five, 10 years, like I did, I distinctly remember, um, when bands started posting music online for the first time on like MySpace, you know, like I, I was, Damn. I was there. I, I watched it happen. Like the first, like my parents had no clue, like what the internet was all about and whether or not it was safe. And I was going on rock bands, MySpace's pages and hearing their songs, you know, b before like, uh, I would hear these bands that would like blow up later on. And I would be hearing their demos on MySpace and stuff. And it's like, really, like, yeah, there's still, you still have to deal with the, the algorithms. You still have to deal with the apps and you still have to deal with, uh, you know, enough people have to like you that, um, that you get shown to more people. Like there's still crappy stuff that you have to deal with that sucks, but at least you don't, uh, at least you're, you're, more of your success is dictated by your own 
um, uh, like, you know, it, like you're one of the first people uh, in a whole generation to figure out this, this subharmonic technique for singing. And TikTok is losing their minds about it. And, mm. and I can promise you from the work that I'm doing with these record labels, you're not on their radar, you know? And, and I think that's sick. Like, mo like almost every major record label and major player in the music industry has no clue how much of a juggernaut you could be uh, if you leveraged your TikTok success into selling uh, albums, you know? Nobody mm -hmm. has, like, nobody in the music world has any clue. It's like when the Wellerman thing blew up, like, the whole music industry was just like, what? Flabbergasted. What, yeah, like, yeah. What, <laughs> what is blowing up? Like, and and to this day, most of <laughs> most of them are still like, oh, those weird kids on one of those internet apps are singing some pirate song. Like, they don't get it. Yeah. So the fact that guys like us That's and crazy, and yeah. many many of the people in the chat, uh, if you're smart about these things and you see, um. You see some kind of an opportunity like, hmm, kids on the internet really seem to like sea shanties lately. Uh, you know, let's make a sea shanty album. If you're, if you're smart enough to capitalize on that, I promise you it's going to be another five years before a mainstream, um, you know, AAA record label band does something like that. And by then, there will be some, some other thing. Because the kids are the yeah. kid the kids are moving on. I'm already talking to people that are like, "Man, it's too late to do sea shanties. That ship has sailed." You know, like I'm already talking to people that are like, "Ah, that that <laughs> trend." Yeah, yeah. Nice. That, there's already people that are like, "Oh, that that trend's over. I'm on to the next thing. I'm on to you know whatever else." But, um, but it's crazy, man. Like it's the 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 whole sea shanty thing. It's interesting because part like. In the same way that I have been working with Howard Benson, who's legendary and uh, and also the other co-owner of the record label is the drummer of Three Days Grace, who I've looked up to for my whole life. And um, uh, it's interesting explaining some of this stuff to them because, like, for many of these people in the music industry, the sea shanty trend came and went before they even realized it was there. And, you know... Uh, Nathan, the guy who, uh, the first, uh, uh, yeah, Nathan yeah, Nubbins. Na uh, yeah, uh, like how many hits does he have on his? Oh my god, yeah, like <laughs> millions, yeah, million, tens Eight, of millions, yeah, probably 81 million on YouTube, and 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 Think mo about it. Yeah, and like think about it like this. This time last year, he he was just like posting these videos for fun. He was like a mailman. Yep. And a year later, this is what happened. Yep. And I think he's probably with a record label, a small record label now, or something that realized how how popular he was, and uh, mm. and wanted to capitalize on it. Let me let me see if I can find this. Uh, <laughs> Johnny Com. Yeah, uh, Johnny commented. Yeah. Yeah, do it. He commented on this. He's like, "Yo, Bobby, we should we should try and make a sea shanty album. That sounds like a good idea." Wait, you guys aren't you guys like doing that or something? Yes. The, okay. Yeah, that's yeah, a that's, joke. that's 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 the joke. That's the joke. Okay. Yeah, uh, 156 million plays on Spotify. Most of the music industry is still absolutely scrambling. Uh, most of them have no clue why this is popular we can say why it's popular you and i and johnny can talk about the cultural through line of kids that got excited about things like dungeons and dragons and and tv shows about pirates and vikings mm. and things and we can talk about those cultures that developed on the internet and how we grew up playing video games and video games have pirates and vikings in them and now these grown-up kids that played you know watch pirates of the caribbean as a kid are now singing the song that they remember uh, hearing in a Pirates of the Caribbean movie when they were a kid, hoist the colors, you know, we're like, like, we can explain that stuff because we were there and we saw that stuff yeah. and that stuff exists in our memories and we're sharing that with the other viewers who have those same memories. But 
the the record label executives who are you know running these labels have no clue about that stuff most of them still don't yeah. know how video games work you know what i mean so and and it's just the new generation and and for reference like i know i know this because i have made money doing this for a while like 158 million plays like you can buy a house with that like you know what i mean like yeah like like and Maybe not just with the Spotify, but the f the fact that you know 158 million on Spotify, 80 million on YouTube, and this was after his video already blew up. This was this was the full version of the song that he tried to get people to listen to after mm -hmm. the trend had already kind of spiraled out of control, and then he went into a music studio and did this version. But despite that, he had to scramble to 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 find a way to make a full version of the song after it already spiraled out of control, he still has like thousands and thousands of dollars. And, yeah. and, and that's just one of these trends. I'm not even talking yeah. about the entire, the entire niche of Minecraft techno music that's generating hundreds of millions of dollars every year on YouTube and, and nobody knows about it, you know? Anyway, I digress. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. I remember literally because this time last year, Johnny reached out to me because, um, like, small record labels started reaching out about the Wellerman thing. The people who were on the TikTok that was on the Stephen Colbert show. Yeah. That was the fastest I've ever been a part of a song that was professionally produced. Literally yeah. the next week we had the video done. We had all these things done. Also... My my computer is charging, but it's also at two percent, so it might die in yeah. a second now. No worries. Well, we should probably wrap it up anyway. But uh, yeah, I think we hit all our points. We yeah. hit all our points. If you want to be a musician, if you want to be a singer, now's the the best time in history. Minecraft techno. I yeah. mean, uh, yeah. What are you saying? <laughs> oh man. Well, Bobby, we'll have to do this again sometime and uh, and talk about more nerdy music stuff. And uh, oh, I'd love that. This has been an absolute pleasure, and I'm so glad that we did this. And uh, yeah, me too. Yeah, time flies. Dived into conversations I didn't even think about. Yeah, man, it's awesome. And I'm looking forward even to even when it's about compressors. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, compressors. You know, I got all, all sorts of stuff like that in my bag that we could talk about for f three and a half hours. But uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, this has been sick. Um, we'll do this more often. Uh, Bobby, looking forward to working with you more very soon um, on all those things oh, yeah. that uh, we will not be mentioning yet. And uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, probably going to call it quits. Do you have any closing thoughts, Bobby? Uh, just, no. I'm very happy with how this went. I hope you guys who are watching right now enjoyed it. And if you have any more recommendations for stuff like this, because this was the first time I've done something like this, um, definitely definitely recommend it to me and i will check it out because it could be another great thing like this sweet but yeah that's it thanks for watching yeah thank you guys so much uh i'm jonathan young and i'll see you next time i'm bobby beast i'll see you next time bye bye